Итак, мы начинаем сессию объединения корпоративных юристов о радикальном изменении функционала юристов корпорации. Laws uh, has already been discussed. We spoke uh, about uh, the leadership of a law in a company. We discussed the motivation and efficiency for the cooperation together. Today we are discussing the functionality, how the filling of the functions of the law at a company changes in accordance with the challenges of our time that raises new and new tasks. How should we build the function and how Uh, should we manage the risks? How should we treat and how should we correlate with the compliance function with legal PR, with legal risk management? Today we're going to discuss all these matters. So that is the end of my brief welcome address and I ask you to participate actively in our session, in our discussion so that we'll uh, really have a discussion, and it is with great pleasure that I give the floor to uh, moderator Igor Maidanik. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. It's very pleasant uh, to see a lot of people in this audience. Last year, a similar event was held at the end of the legal forum, and there were uh, also a lot of people, and we finished our discussion much later than it was previously played, but uh, planned. Just to start our today's discussion, I will give you some brief information proceeding from my personal experience and transformation, concerning transformation of the legal service. Uh, I worked for a short period at the prosecutor's office then. I was always the head of the legal service. First, that was Alpha Echo, then Tinka, then Tinka BP, and at Tinka BP, at some stage, I wanted to attain something more. And I decided that uh, I was not uh, eager to deal with business, and I thought that it would be good if uh, I uh, engage in GR. I understood what it meant, and uh, I received this proposal. And practically, I just started to fill that position. But as you know, at the same period, uh, negotiations started on uh, acquisition of TNKBP by Rosneft. At the same time, the heads of the legal service of Rosneft uh, uh, filled the positions of the state secretary. and. Uh, the managers of GR, and once this person worked uh, at uh, Tenka as my deputy, and unexpectedly I received a proposal from Nestneft to become the head of the legal service of Rosneft. I'm not uh, just discussing my own uh, positions, but I would like to say that transformation of the legal profession is inevitable. Uh, if you uh, want to determine the priorities and draw the boundaries, that is not the same. I realize today that these are different things and time will be needed to develop certain approaches to that. And I'm sure that each company, in each company that will happen in a different way, and I suggest that today we discuss that theme. But uh, there are people who understand well the essence of the problem and of the matter. We're not going to talk about GR and legal uh, uh, support. We'll speak about corporate manager. Is a corporate secretary a lawyer or not? We're going to discuss compliance and we're going to discuss ethical matters. So we're going to have a rather fruitful discussion today. The only thing that I want this time or this year at the forum, we came across the following. We have a very dense schedule, and the uh, speakers have a limited time for making presentation. And at none 
of the uh, round tables there was a possibility of discussion. There was no discussion because there was no possibility to ask questions. Uh, everyone took the floor, applauded, and then left. I don't want to have a similar situation here because we have some matters to discuss. So l will you please ask questions immediately after each uh, presentation made by the speaker? And now I would like to give the floor to Alevstina Kamilikova, Director of the Legal Service, uh, Russia. CNS Zao Alcatel Lucent. Thank you very much. How loud it is. Can you hear me? Thank you very much for the opportunity to take the floor. What I'm going to talk about recently, uh, really, the theme is quite important and uh, for the last uh, three or four years and um, in the framework of our theme laws and business we often raise the question concerning the role of the law in the company how it expands and how uh, we can find common language with our business and we are considering it in on a certain basis yes the role of the law is increasing and i would like to add uh, certain aspects, emphasizes such uh, things. Speaking about the growing role of the lawyers, we mentioned certain stages passed by the lawyer legal function, the cooperation, there, are, uh, there is a service level of providing services, there is a more consolidated expert opinion when a lawyer adds uh, added value, and there is a lawyer who is a business partner, uh, who is a reliable uh, assistant of business, and there is a lawyer who is a business leader who, in principle, not only participates in the decision-making, but some gives recommendations concerning strategic business decisions that give additional profit to the company and are quite legitimate. In this form, seeing this dynamic, I would like to read one phrase that I like very much uh, by a professor of Harvard University who speaks about the development of legal profession. He perceives a lawyer as a lawyer with big corporation, internal lawyer as a lawyer with a state mode of thinking. And that thinking involves the possibility of understanding long-term consequences of the decision taking, but not uh, how to reach uh, the simultaneous advantage. And it is based on the responsibility for the public interests and not for the personal benefit. It is important to analyze our pr profession from this viewpoint. We understand that business is evolving. It goes beyond the limits of one state. Now that is a typical situation when business is conducted under several jurisdictions, sometimes across the world, sometimes these are uh, 100 or 20 states where you need legal support. And in this case, uh, the law department is not only a service, uh, these are the people who become the core of adequate response and uh, preventive analysis as to how the company should position in different jurisdictions. Life never gives uh, difficult questions to us in a refined form uh, as uh, articles of the code. It formulates uh, complicated questions, so we, the lawyers of the corporation, have in somehow to separate these difficult matters into specific legal situations and to offer their solutions. Eventually, the lawyer comes across the difficulties as the first person, and he has to adapt a complicated legal phenomena. And among such complicated legal phenomena, as far as I understand, uh, are uh, two phenomena, what we see, the developing a complex of legal norms regulated in the fundamentals of interaction and compliance, which in the Russian language is uh, you, uh, is called by that borrowed word compliance. Probably finally will uh, just design some other professional term in Russian. And to a certain extent, 
uh, relations with the state as the regulator and as the source of the norms and the source as this uh, state, uh, a state that regulates the application of the norms. I would define this conglomerate of relations as GR from the British government relations. We also can see that these complicated legal relations emerge. And de facto, not uh, speaking about the expansion or non-expansion of the role of the law, we can see that lawyers live in the reality when these two complicated integrated phenomena or legal relations uh, are recorded. So we, uh, as legal service, just have to respond to this. Speaking about compliance, we understand that the importance of that theme should not be underestimated because it is really directly impacting the corporations that go beyond the limits of one state and whose shares are listed at different stock exchanges and as it was mentioned today, as soon as you need uh, the international borrowed capital, you come across this problem and you have uh, just to take account of the reality mm, uh, and to use the understandable international framework. And the role of the lawyer in these uh, regulations, in regulating of these uh, legal relations, is quite important. As far as I understand, it is highly important to have a legal background while assessing these integrated phenomena. Compliance per se is an integrated instrument, and we can see that now uh, probably that is a, a new created sub uh, sect of the law. You might argue with me, but there are uh, facts that many people are taken away with it. Probably that is a cross sectoral discipline that covers uh, practically. Uh, so, uh, the uh, corruption, for instance, infringes or can infringe all the norms of the law. So, I don't see that there will be a beginning or an end of that complicated system of legal relations. And the role of the law in analyzing that complicated system should be prioritized. We should be no note that there are no requirements to the profession. And being a professional community, we have to respond to it and ask who is a person uh, who is an analyst of those uh, complicated legal relations, primarily because, in my understanding, that is a problem related to methodology, because methodology determines the quality of the result obtained. If we know who is doing it, and lawyers should be doing it, or people with legal background, will receive such qualitative results expressed in decreasing numbers of corruption, corruptive actions. Uh, the role of a corporate law in that field. Uh, I can see in mass media some strange statements that there are some people uh, other than lawyers who should generalize the global knowledge on the matter and uh, give advice to the lawyers as how to solve these matters. I understand that this uh, needs further consideration. I mean these statements. I don't believe that the lawyer should just uh, give advice using some configuration of the law, not seeing the phenomena in general. Not only I don't believe, but the Western legal system doesn't believe it. They have such a legal act as Severance Oxley, uh, the well-known SOX, there is a clear rule, uh, or it includes the direct duty of the law of the corporation to advise on the merit of the operation, not using uh, the legal configurations uh, and uh, give a scholastic analysis, which according to the rules of the law is okay, but it really infringes the situation and results in certain possibilities of setting up an incorrect system that will uh, might be used for the corruption purposes. What I'm trying to tell you, the lawyers, uh, proceeding from the long-term Western experience uh, and the forming Russian experience, the lawyers of the corporation, 
uh, have a positive personal responsibility to uh, go beyond the limits of the law and to consider the process on the merit and uh, give advice on the merit just to level the possible risks, including compliance risks. And I think that such changes, qualitative changes in our uh, profession is a fact that has to be taken into account. And I would like to consider uh, the personal responsibility of a corporate lawyer who uh, that uh, is assigned uh, in a great number of regulatory acts. Probably as a professional community will form a certain code of conduct of a corporate lawyer or law in general, which probably, oh, I don't think it will be a panacea, but probably this question should be considered in some form. I mean, some ethical norms that have to be adopted. I don't think that if a legal community would not solve the questions of compliance, that will be for someone's benefit. That is my vision at present. Uh, thank you, Aliftina. Uh, you raised very important problems. When I worked at 10 KBP, I didn't have any uh, legislative duty, uh, but I provided different guarantees because BP is a public company, and uh, I had to do it as a general counsel of Tenka BP. Uh, my uh, question is as follows. Do you think that it is necessary to uh, approve by legislation the duties of the main law of the company on implementation of compliance, observance of compliance? We can have long debates on that theme and the internal audit, audit and back office would interfere because today a lot is being done and a lot of regulatory documents are adopted to combat corruption. But one of the laws which uh, probably would supplement that uh, package of documents uh, substantially would be the legislative support of the duties of the main law that will increase the status of the main law. I don't know how it uh, should be done, either as a law or some codes of conduct, because I think a law is a stringent, uh, so to say, uh, an ob a stringent law, an obelisk in place where the risk uh, law was standing. We have to uh, determine the question of, for, of personal responsibility for the quality of advice, but how it should be done? Should it be a law on norms of ethical conduct? Probably uh, it should be a self-regulatory regulated profession. Probably in our uh, professional community it can be done. We, uh, we have such uh, notions in the world as a good name that should not be spoiled, uh, possibility of access to the profession. We might apply such soft uh, regulatory acts or uh, rule, sets of rules, not a law probably. As for the law, I believe that I was uh, never thinking about it. You ask me that uh, question that is quite new to me and I'm answering straight away. I think that we should uh, state that if a lawyer has seen a certain set of elements which were caused uh, by a certain corruptive scheme, and if he didn't respond to them, uh, the, uh, that shouldn't be regarded as a uh, as qualitative, high quality legal aid. I think that will be implemented uh, more easily. Uh, have I answered your question? Yes, the answer is clear. And I didn't ask you just to adopt some direct law, but just a formation of a behavior model in needs time, and the legal community uh, has to be pushed towards recording the duties of the main lawyer in respect of observance of compliance and providing of high quality services. And this way I agree with you. Moreover, I think that there should be just, and I'm a favorite, 
we should determine the duties of the people who give advice in respect of compliance. They should be personally responsible for their advice. I would proceed in this way. It is impossible to limit oneself writing the codes uh, of conduct and then uh, putting uh, the stars uh, uh, based on the courses which you have delivered. That should be a sensible advice, taking into account all the possible risk. And I can't say any specialist that can, be, uh, can give such analysis at 360 degrees, uh, except lawyers. For instance, lawyers offer 300 degrees of 360 degrees of that analysis, so probably it should be combined. If there were representatives of internal audit, uh, probably we'll start an ardent discussion as to whom, uh, who can give an assessment. But nevertheless, I would like to thank you for that interesting theme which you have touched upon. And I'm ready to give the floor for the comments and for the questions. Do you have a microphone? May I make a brief comment? Uh, speaking about uh, the responsibility of the lawyer in respect of compliance, we should realize what we are talking about. We are speaking about the responsibility of the lawyer for the advice or co-responsibility of the lawyer for the result of applying our advice for the result which emerged in the company after implementing the recommendations and the procedures that were granted by the lawyers. How legal functionality should be built. We're giving advice, uh, uh, high quality advice, and uh, business should apply it in accordance with our recommendations and as we have given it. If as a result the re business applies our advice not as we planned it uh, and uh, the advice result would be unfavorable, uh, the lawyer uh, has uh, says that his uh, responsibility has finished after giving the advice. Is it necessary to implement the functionality of the lawyer uh, for being responsible for the results of business activities if uh, the uh, results are fable based on our high quality advice? Would we like to change the functionality of the lawyers in this uh, way? Uh, this way is it inherent in the concept of business? partnership, which de facto is becoming a part of the functionality of the law department. I have this uh, comment and uh, question to the audience. What should be uh, regarded as uh, the responsibility of the law as compliance? I will uh, read four lines from Sox. What, in their opinion, the lawyer should do? Uh, he should point, inform about uh, the serious infringement of the law by the company and uh, duly respond to such uh, violations, taking the necessary measures on coping with them and uh, informing the independent control bodies of the companies that might be the committee of the on audit or the board of directors. And uh, not going to the police, but the question is that you have uh, the bodies which manage the company and you should uh, make them aware of the situation. If uh, you have reached uh, the committee on auditing and the board of directors of the company, if you have got written documents corroborating it, I think you have fulfilled your moral duty. I have a different viewpoint. There should be a personal responsibility of the main lawyer, but being a moderator, I will stop the discussion between representatives uh, of the audience and the speaker. Let us communicate with the audience, otherwise uh, our uh, discussion will then finish. Roman Hadekin, part uh, of uh, uh, London office of Bernadette and Business. In Russia, you are discussing the idea of reforming the loyal law profession. What is your opinion? Should the in, uh, internal lawyers become uh, the members of that uh, uh, Corporation in the UK, the internal uh, lawyers are solicitors, and the duties of the solicitor to the court prevails to his is resp in respect to his duty to the customer. He cannot uh, give an advice to the customer that will contradict the law, 
and as a result he will be dismissed from the corporation never to be restored there that results in a uh, high legality of the activity of the company the same situation is recorded in york what is the attitude of the panelists whether the inner lawyer should become a members of that uh, joint profession if it happens Uh, maybe it was not addressed to me, but I think it's quite a logical thought. I don't know what our discussion about the unified legal profession will uh, end up with. So just we have been debating it for five years already. But I think that in-house lawyers, uh, as uh, legal representatives of the legal profession, as others, and we have to have unified uh, requirements to the quality of our services rendered, whether we're in-house or external lawyers. Um, I fully uh, um, support such an approach because uh, I wouldn't uh, sign up for exclusive uh, status uh, for uh, some categories of lawyers, so it will take us away from the stereotypes and behavioral stereotypes. Uh, so the next uh, presenter is Maria Abramova, Gazprom Nev, General Director. Thank you very much, Igor. Uh, hello, good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'm very happy to see you all here, and I'm very happy that the topic that we are discussing today um, has uh, such uh, active response from the legal profession. Uh, so it is largely on depending on in-house uh, lawyers in their routine work and uh, the help that they render to their uh, shareholders and uh, shape up uh, the approaches to the legal profession uh, should find their full reflection in the standards, legal standards of, uh, that we are discussing today. Can you put my presentation on? I would like to set a tone, general tone for the discussion. Why? So we have termed out a theme quite broadly, but we uh, should stick to the key uh, core issues, what is that we want from the legal functionality and what kind of recommendations or guidelines we can uh, have as a result of this discussion. So the uh, uh, kind of legal uh, function uh, includes uh, uh, so the, uh, the degree of the solution of the problem, uh, so the level of ex expertise and competence, the client satisfaction, and relieving risks for the company. I think, uh, speaking of these four major functions, we should understand that it's not just legal support, but this is also a function of control. When the general counsel is, uh, acts as a representative of the interest not only of the company uh, leadership, but also of its shareholders, uh, and I think that uh, fun the right functionality will be ensured only if our functions on top uh, will be matched by reasonable costs and as reasonable staff members, number, number of staff in the company that have to provide for this function. Uh, so the, our function will cost more than the goals, uh, otherwise than the goals that we put. Speaking of the function, uh, could you put on the next slide, please? I apologize for this technical nuisance. So if we go further uh, to uh, subdivide the legal functionality uh, into the Maslow pyramid, and we already discussed it uh, in one of the Mercure organized forum. We'll have a, a pyramid uh, that takes functions. So operational uh, and this routine uh, activity is at the basis uh, of this pyramid. And then uh, I subdivided this function into a component, which is corporate law and asset management, uh, intellectual prop uh, property and antitrust uh, 
a regulation and just uh, major business projects and just uh, uh, um, and others uh, up to strategy of the company and strategic uh, risks uh, of the company. Uh, so this pyramid can be uh, amended depending on the functionality of this or that law and. Uh, uh, so whether it is an economic uh, industry as such or a single company uh, situation, uh, you will uh, have more or less similar functionality that the uh, lawyers have to provide for. So now I'm asking a question how much, uh, how, to what extent the risk manager compliance and GR can be included into this Maslow pyramid for lawyers and how well it intersects with our legal functionality. So if we go to the risk management slide, uh, then uh, relieving, reducing risks, so relieving risks for the company, uh, we uh, stated it as a, a one of the wants of the legal profession. So it will also be part of the Maslow pyramid. So finally, the, the conclusion, could you show the third slide, please? Uh, so I discussed it with our colleagues uh, while thinking about our roundtable discussion. Oh, please, can you put the next slide on? Thank you. Uh, so speaking of the uh, GR, uh, risk management and compliance versus the um, legal function and their uh, ratio, uh, relationship between them, I try to structure uh, the three major elements that will determine the constituent components inside this Maslow pyramid and what we include and not include into this pyramid. The structure of the company, the structure of the legal function. So what the the company and the client wants has to be matched by the legal function. So securities and banking sector where the regulation and over-regulation level uh, of the business is so high uh, that, uh, of course, risk management and compliance should be indispensable part of the legal functionality, otherwise it's a criminal negligence. So the structure of business, uh, so it's um, a need in um, specialist legal skills or required legal skills, and I want to bring you back to the five-year role discussion uh, when just we spoke about the non-organic and organic uh, growth of uh, companies. Uh, of, uh, there was a need to m and uh, lawyers and just lawyers who can buy assets quickly and sell them. So let's uh, look in retrospect what happened in the recent three years, uh, just uh, construction, uh, just uh, infrastructural projects that also call for some specialist skills and knowledge and some other things that are being, that are changing today. And thirdly, I want to uh, mention what uh, I hope my colleagues are going to uh, pick up on. It's the structure of the holding and then the structure of the legal service in holding. If, uh, so if the com company has a form of a holding, then the legal function uh, has a certain influence there. And we can speak about the functional uh, structure of shaping up the legal service, and including GR compliance and risk management as part of the legal service, which is necessary to provide for the needs of the business in the specific over-regulated segment. So these are the major uh, uh, ideas that I wanted to throw in at the beginning of our discussion. And uh, I think it's not uh, our job uh, uh, to tell how it should be, but to trigger off a discussion and solicit comments and uh, uh, exchange from the audience. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, then, Maria, I have a um, uh, question. From, uh, if uh, we spoke about the relationship between compliance and legal function, 
Uh, first, I would like to switch on to GR and focus on that. So, uh, practical question. Uh, so, one of the roundtable discussions here uh, within the framework of this forum was devoted to lobbyism. I think that it's rather a GR function, however, there is an, an important part uh, of this direction, which is lawmaking. Because any bill, any draft legislation can have a serious effect on the future of the company and may have gross implications for it. So where do you put this function? If uh, you can answer this question, where would you put it? An interesting question. Indeed, at the beginning of my uh, legal career, I used to work in a state body uh, that was uh, involved in the lawmaking in one of the major uh, entities of the Russian Federation, and just the function related to the uh, lawmaking was separated from the legal function, because the legal function is such that provided for the activity of the state body, and the lawmaking function would be not in ad, ad, uh, uh, not in uh, conflict, but uh, not, not in uh, not antagonistic to each other, but at conflict uh, with each other. Uh, because uh, these uh, these are not law lobbies are not just the ones who go through the corridors of power, but those uh, are, who who work uh, to make laws inside uh, the company. And there is uh, uh, always uh, th this relationship is always prone with the conflict with. Uh, the so when we discuss the civil code draft, uh, Igor, if you remember how much we discussed it, basing on uh, a whole series of roundtable discussions and scientific conferences, but uh, it was not until this draft was uh, tabled for the Duma discussion, the professional community never woke up, and then we had to act quick in order to somehow incorporate our own vision and understanding uh, to this draft so that we could make make it uh, uh, proper for our business, uh, for the business uh, that we have to support. So a legal function has to trace up such things and get involved in this process, not at the very late last stage, but work together in conjunction with academia and uh, with the legal community uh, so that we could work together and uh, develop such drafts as a joint effort. Thank you. I think uh, about uh, very similar lines because a quite obvious principle is that lawmaking is not 100 percent, but to a greater percent is a lawyer's job. Because if you delegate n law making function to GR, uh, uh, you will uh, uh, basic, basically uh, uh, just stimulate uh, further migration of lawyers. Uh, in the company, because they, uh, just with all due respect to external counsels and and uh, and external uh, advi legal advisors, uh, speaking of the advantage of having an in-house uh, uh, lawyer, an in-house department, uh, is that uh, you, uh, the responsibility uh, uh, for the decisions taken is much higher, so we can be the, almost the last resort. So this migration of lawyers across the company is quite a, uh, an alerting uh, trend. So should anyone have uh, any comments or ideas to share, please, I invite you now or later. Uh, if there are no other questions, I would like to turn the floor over to Ruslan Ibrahimov, who is the Vice President for Cooperative and Legal Issues of uh, MTS. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. So, just two comments before they are downloading my presentation. Uh, what I, the message I want to deliver now, it's analysis of our own practice in the telecom company MTS. And I have no claims for uh, giving profound analysis for the whole market. Secondly, the terminology used here are, is conventional. They are not scholarly words, so please uh, show understanding to that. And uh, also maybe some... Um, Things that I'm going to say will sound trivial for my colleagues who are corporate lawyers, but um, I believe it is important voicing those issues. Uh, 
because I believe that this uh, that I'm going to speak about some important trends for corporate lawyers. So I really can't switch over those slides. It's a challenge. So the first slide uh, is just an illustration um, as a starting point. Main approaches to understanding the content of the legal function within the corporation. There are two approaches, the so-called classical approach. This is when lawyers deal in operational issues, they uh, identify risks and provide some services. Uh, so uh, actually uh, this function remains relevant and uh, serves companies well, but uh, basically these are companies operating on non-diversified markets. Uh, so with stable regulation, uh, very weak regulation, I would add. So this is an office-like function. The second approach, uh, more state-of-the-art, the approach that is uh, used in diversified markets, and uh, it is exercised by public companies or the companies that want to become public and uh, the companies that operate on uh, the markets where the regulatory uh, means are rapidly developing. So then mm, new functions are added to legal departments. It's an, an analysis, forecasting, uh, identifying risks at early stage, at the stage of their emergence, uh, including at the stage of some legal initiatives and also the function of creating additional opportunities in business, assistance in uh, uh, designing business solutions. Uh, summarizing the above said, this uh, function differs from back office one because it is uh, uh, aimed at creating added value for the company. At least this is how we see it. Mm, the next slide, please. Uh, this diagram, Mm, shows the evolution of the legal function and I will dwell on it for a little bit longer because it gives us some retrospective analysis of uh, this function. I'm using the word evolution even though this session is about radical changes but uh, I would uh, say that radical changes they occurred between the end of the 90s or the beginning of the 90s and the beginning of the century. This is when really revolutionary changes uh, happened. But otherwise, we see evolution here. So in the upper part, the vertical axis rather, it's the axis of risk management and opportunity creation. And uh, you see three parts in it. When there is no risk management, when risk management exists, but it's uh, reactive. Uh, and the third stage is when risk management is proactive in its nature. The horizontal axis is the time axis. And uh, so thus the diagram shows the evolution of the function. Blue color uh, and shows the Mm, prerequisites that really generated the changes. And the arrows, the big arrow, uh, shows the direction of the whole trend, but then for each sub-function you see smaller arrows that uh, demonstrate the trend for this sub-function today towards uh, reactive uh, response to risk management or towards proactive approach. So these are sub-evolutions of sub-functions. Uh, so this diagram shows that before 2001, uh, before IPO uh, for MTS, nothing was happening actually. Uh, the function was diluted and uh, the negative aspect of that situation was emphasized by the eager, so there was no consolidated function as one fist. Uh, lawyers uh, were uh, attributed to different mm, uh, 
business units and uh, they rendered legal support to those separate units, isolated units. Uh, hence, no alignment, uh, continuing uh, disputes between the lawyers of the same company. It was like soccer game when they were just uh, throwing the ball. And uh, the changes began when the company became public after the IPO. The arrow starts going up at this stage. And the first thing that emerges in addition to the classical uh, legal function is the function of corporate management, or corporate governance rather, that was actually stipulated by the legislation of the Russian Federation and the New York Stock Exchange requirements. And uh, it uh, happened even before the code of corporate governance was uh, uh, issued in Russia. So from the point of view of risk management and opportunity creation, it was on the edge between no management, but uh, towards uh, closer to reactive response. Uh, then uh, you see the development of this uh, function. Right now, we've surpassed uh, the phase of uh, reactive response, and we are coming onto the stage of proactive response. What I mean is that we are witnessing serious changes in the legal base uh, and the legislation on cor corporate law. A lot of uh, uh, just uh, court cases are now admitted as. Uh, Mm, precedence by the court and this function uh, we've had this function since the year 2002 within the company and that enabled us to accumulate rich experience and uh, that empowers us to, uh, to start designing certain norms and assisting in legal changes on higher level so it's rather a conservative function actually uh, but uh, within this, uh, within MTS, we try to give a certain momentum for its further development towards proactiveness. And we have already formulated uh, quite a no great number of suggestions for improvement uh, that have been uh, accepted by the legal practice. Mm, the next serious stage or phase uh, it's uh, the review of the uh, legal base in the industry, the industry law. So since 2004 we had a new law and it uh, was enforced, but it had rather uh, reference character and uh, actually the industry was regulated by bylaws. Uh, and instructions. Those instructions were to be designed in big uh, quantities because the business is continuous process and uh, it needs clear-cut rules of the game. So as you see, uh, at this stage we created a new uh, function within the legal department uh, that is uh, analytical function. Uh, this uh, is not about day-to-day uh, support of the business, but analysts are just uh, thinking people, thinkers who try uh, to get insights and uh, identify trends of the industry development. Uh, so at that point of time, we uh, recognize the importance of GR creation, proactive risk management uh, creation. GR um, is in quotation marks here because this uh, would uh, be uh, better to say that this is management of regulatory risks. Uh, so these are the risks that are associated with the active law and uh, normatives that we have. So we, our interpretation of this function is uh, uh, that of a legal function, because this is about writing the rules of the game. And maybe in our, on our market it has uh, most relevance because uh, it's neither access to resources nor access to services but the rules of the game that decide uh, everything. We have GR that we call functional GR and uh, uh, each non-legal uh, department or subsidiary tackles rather serious uh, issues with licensing, frequency access, uh, administrative commissions, but we are not uh, dealing with that. 
we uh, leave it for our what we call functional GR, mm, GR that is to be done by uh, subfunctions. Operational GR, on the other hand, mm, it's uh, uh, like an uh, ongoing process. Uh, it's like, you know, icicles hanging down from the roof. So there are people uh, walking around every day and knocking them down. So this uh, GR is a current GR, so we are not assuming this uh, on ourselves. Because we see our role as participation in law creation and normatives creation. So in the beginning of this century, we assisted MTS in... Uh, Mm, just uh, surviving through the turbulence zone, uh, which was because of the frame character of the law on communication, and that's why a lot of bylaws were necessary to rectify it. Then, uh, 2005, 2006 are the years when uh, MTS started an active expansion uh, on the market by non-organic growth through mergers and acquisitions. So annually we had about 40 um, projects on merger and acquisitions and uh, uh, thinking about whether we need it as a separate function because uh, previously we had it integrated into other functions. Uh, so strategists of the company, they identified the direction of further uh, development and the lawyers just assisted them in implementing the strategy. But when we uh, faced the situation when the company started active mergers and acquisitions, we realized that we also uh, must have some responsibility within it. So this is how this uh, type of uh, function was uh, generated. It happened on the edge of uh, between the reactive and proactive regulation. And you can see two arrows pointing up. And uh, these two functions uh, are to play proactive role, creating added values, assisting in prompt uh, actions, uh, and uh, assisting in closing transactions. And uh, not only that, mm, uh, Post-closing integrational processes uh, are also part of its prerogative. You know, when you buy a company, uh, that means quite a lot of uh, things to do, like integration of assets and uh, just allocation of assets to the acquired subsidiary. So lawyers uh, uh, felt that they should really assume some of the power at this moment. And uh, that's uh, why we decided to assume this function, uh, seeing uh, uh, our goal as acting proactively and even aggressively. Then uh, the letters are too small for me to see, so I look into my cheat sheet. So what happens next? 2008. 2008 was marked by the activization of the uh, enforcement of international anti-corruption legislation. Uh, uh, so um, it happened um, uh, in the United States of America, and we also decided that we must have such a function created in the company. At first, we didn't even discuss where to attach it, because first we had to uh, design the rules of the game. So, And designing rules of the game is a primordial uh, legal function. Uh, uh, so we were delegated uh, this responsibility of writing the rules even at that time. So it was uh, about politics and uh, time frames and regulations and uh, rules and all that. And we formulated the rules, building on uh, the uh, uh, experience of uh, anti-corruption law uh, uh, enforcement in the United States of America. So 2009, when we stopped main acquisitions and we started integrating the acquired companies uh, so this was a huge process. 
uh, that really surpass the uh, borderlines of corporate governance, and we uh, decided to isolate uh, the uh, uh, sub-function uh, to deal with uh, corporate law. Uh, so again, we wanted to uh, this uh, uh, function to operate, and that's why we decided to isolate it into a separate unit. We uh, thus kept uh, specialists, uh, offering them interesting career prospects. So thus, uh, we created the uh, function. This was uh, antitrust. Uh, mm, uh, and we liquidated the so-called collector function. We decided against uh, just uh, collecting debts, uh, and uh, at that time the debt was huge, it was about 200 million US dollars, so we uh, outsourced this col debt collecting function. Uh, 2012, um, uh, antitrust uh, activities, uh, became very active, and uh, this was the period when the, in the Russian Federation they reviewed uh, the legislation. We couldn't uh, stay apart from this process. So then we uh, just uh, made requirements to all our services. So when uh, recruiting and hiring new employees, uh, they must know antitrust legislation. So in this case, we did not uh, create any uh, separate function, but we tried to uh, acquire the missing competences in the company. Uh, thus, mm, I'll go back to anti-trust or anti-corruption uh, function. So the ideology uh, and the documentation, we have about 26 internal documents on this theme. Uh, so we finished this. And then the question arose whether we should keep it uh, within our department or where we should also sort of outsource it. I did, well, didn't feel like keeping it because we were making a transition uh, from the stage of uh, pro uh, uh, providing documents to the stage of rendering support. Uh, so this type of work is pregnant with conflict and uh, requires lots of efforts and so on and so forth. So by then we had analyzed uh, the world practice and more than half of the companies that have compliances in the world they keep this compliance function within their legal department. So we decided to have a separate unit directly subordinated to CEO. And uh, as you see, mm, the arrow started going down towards 2013. Why? The reason, well, it's very simple. We created a department, or rather sub uh, departments, units. There were 25 people, and then we realized that just physically they simply can't uh, deal with all the process. What they can do, they can lecture to the company's employees, explaining how things shouldn't and can't be done. And that goes back to the very first stage, and uh, lawyers uh, just uh, strive to depart from this approach. Mm, uh, so the compliance system must be integrated everywhere. Uh, but where can we find enough uh, specialists on that? So it took us two months to realize that. And then people came to CEO saying, we need lawyers, we can't do anything without that. We can do something within our corporate center, but uh, not much. So we had a huge dispute about that. and so. That's why this area starts going down a little bit, because uh, uh, right now we are facing a high level of uncertainty. And, uh, but what lessons should be learned? Uh, uh, thinking about which functions should be where, we must uh, build this on an understanding of real life. If you want to have a separate function, then you must think about how to stuff it. Right now, uh, qualified uh, specialists are scarce. Uh, 
um, what's the difference uh, between uh, normal legal function and compliance fu function? Uh, historically, lawyers uh, participated in decision making, but they never made decisions. They never assumed decision making. And uh, uh, but when we uh, consider the uh, new compliance function, compliance means uh, decision making whether we go this way or whether we do not go this way. And uh, right now we are at this crossroads. So whether we try to avoid this responsibility or whether we assume it. So today, likewise to many of you present here, I have no clear-cut answers to this question. But I just wanted to admit that this is where we are now. And the last comment on that slide. I put three questions here, mm, uh, 2013, 2014, and all that. Who is going to tackle that? I do not have full confidence, but I believe that, according to mm, uh, the opinion of our experts, uh, lawyers will start dealing with this, with compliance. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll have an impossible situation with two verticals of power and uh, uh, double subordination, and uh, this never works. Mm. I'm responsible for co compliance and the level of the corporate center, but uh, uh, just uh, this uh, is, uh, this uh, situation is too complex and uh, it yields, uh, and it's not effective really. Another, uh, thing that we thought about in relation to corporate compliance. It can be uh, the thought that is re not really new for Western countries, but it's new for Russia. So another matter of our concern was, and it was discussed yesterday at dinner, that the penalties or the fines uh, that are charged to antitrust uh, services are the highest. Antitrust uh, procedures became tangible like uh, they cost tangible assets, and we can't but respond to that. So right now we're thinking whether to launch uh, the special process for uh, corporate compliance management. This is controlling managers, how they comply. First and foremost, I'm thinking about cartels, because cartels now, it's a simple thing. It's an oral agreement that can entail consequences. Two managers from two companies, they sit down to talk and then they uh, jokingly decided to raise their prices together. And regardless of the fact whether that happens in real life or not, you can claim that this is the beginning of a cartel. And uh, forcing people, forcing managers within companies not to do it this way. Well, it's difficult because there are no tools or mechanisms. We read lectures, we warn, we uh, try to educate, but uh, then uh, there is rotation of personnel, new people come, and it doesn't work. We must have some regular function, real mechanism, that would not only describe the desired behavior, but also enforce it and uh, do continuous monitoring. Otherwise, we are facing huge risks. And finally, what we're thinking about now, it's uh, tax compliance. Mm, what uh, has brought us to this idea? We are among five other major Russian companies uh, that uh, uh, signed an agreement with the Federal Tax Service in March, an agreement on horizontal monitoring. I believe yesterday one of the sessions of this forum was dedicated to this issue. Five major companies in this company, they do all that online. Uh, they uh, do tax returns online. And then there, another question arises. Uh, do we have a right for mistake? Yes, we do. But are we given time to correct a mistake? It's online. So time is a major issue. So most likely there is no time to correct your mistakes. And then we started thinking in depth about the procedures and about how to build them in order to minimize the possibility of such mistakes to happen. And uh, 
uh, this again brings us to the word compliance. I don't know whether it's scientific enough approach or not. But these are the challenges that we are facing. This is what we are thinking about. And hopefully in the future, I'll be able to share some of our positive experience. I'm, even, uh, I'm afraid to push this button, really. So I want assistance. Have you pressed it? Therefore, as you understand, all the three functions are in a certain way intersecting in our blocks. We have analyzed it from the viewpoint of the logic of development of the functions using three models. Previously, I have mentioned what models are used by the laws. The first model is the initial statement of prohibition. The second model is statement of prohibition of working with risk and discussing of the possibilities. And the third upper model, prevention of risk and creating possibility and development of decisions. We believe that lawyers are working in a corporate center, that is a third model, Magna and the regions. I think it is sufficient to work on one. Uh, regions. The lawyers have covered the entire palette and are working using uh, that model. Uh, GR, which we introduced in 2006, immediately its task was uh, to uh, operate using the third model because no statements had to be made, otherwise we would be dead. Thus, we uh, became leaders in that work. And initially, no one believed it, but practice has shown that several billion dollars in several years uh, show that the work was quite efficient and it cannot be overrated, uh, overestimated. And finally, compliance, which uh, we had been talking about quite recently. I think that in the second model, we have compliance. And from my viewpoint, if we further continue, uh, doing only compliance, but it will remain this model. However, if we choose another trend, when as lawyers will assume this responsibility to a certain extent, I think that similar to the first two functions, that function will be in the fourth square and probably will try uh, uh, to attain that uh, the business would not uh, feel that compliance function is an evil and the uh, necessity to, to uh, comply with certain rules. We want business to understand the use uh, of this function in real figures. Uh, next. Since we are speaking about three functions, uh, I will just draw the conclusion. It seems to me that there is much in common about these, uh, uh, these functions. Similar instruments of risk management, since we use the unified methods and approaches, and there is a high involvement of the lawyers into the processes, and generally all of them cover the strategy of uh, security that was adopted long ago, and the new emerging processes are covered by our strategy. There were a lot of discussions, as my previous experience uh, shows, related to that GR. And I would like to show the interrelation of the legal function and management or regulatory risk. We have forgotten about the people uh, smoking cigars and walking along the corridors and in expensive suits. Our task is to abandon interpersonal connections. We focus on the knowledge and use of official mechanism and technology of state decision making at all levels of power. And you understand these are the rules of operation of the operators. A high sectoral expertise, which in our sector is mainly concentrated in the companies, multi applied by the norms uh, and rules of rule making law making this is based on ethics and anti corruption approaches and the working on legislative acts we try to reach a high level of 
legal technology. If we sum it up, I can tell you that we don't see that this place would be used elsewhere, uh, but not in the legal department, law department. Now, what is in common between compliance and legal function? Probably there will be a lot of debates. I would recommend to analyze this table more attentively here. There are different trends where, in a certain way, we need to deal with compliance. You see how many they are. Red color shows those trends, which in general are assigned to lawyers at present. Pink color shows the uh, boxes where lawyers are involved into discussion of the problems, and gray color, uh, uh, no lawyers are required. They are required also only from time to time. We uh, have drawn it in the field of compliance, and we can see the companies here, and in most of the functions, the lawyers are involved. Uh, de facto, the lawyers are involved in most uh, uh, of the areas of the company's activity where compliance is needed, but compliance managers now is uh, just uh, involved into ant in anti-corruption legislation only. We might draw the following conclusions, and we can pass on to a possible model. I'm saying uh, what is our situation. That is a legal block. What are the main functions? Of course, they are much more numerous, but these are the basic ones. And today, in this single block, we have these functions. Primarily, these are the operational lawyers uh, who mainly support our business. We shouldn't forget about them. And as always, take into account the needs of the business. Because uh, sometimes we are criticized that we are just forget, uh, forgetting about the classical business. We uh, realize our sources and we take that into account. Uh, uh, judicial lawyers, project lawyers, M&A lawyers, these are two different units, but they are under one circle because both uh, uh, act on the basis of the project uh, principle. Uh, lawyers, analysts in the companies, there should be people who should think and not uh, drive the nails into the walls. Anyway, they should be at some levels of abstract thinking and generalize their own practice of the companies. Lawyers who know corporate law, corporate management, uh, you know what it is in the company, and work with regulatory risks. Uh, only compliance today is under the question mark, because we're just at the uh, forking roads. I don't know how it will be sold in future. And probably uh, these are the possible options of organizing of uh, compliance function. The first option today, we uh, have uh, an approximately uh, approximate situation. Compliance is under the predic uh, president, and dotted line leads to the regional lawyers. So this is our experiment, was compliance uh, at the top should interact the actions and practical work except for lectures with lawyers. I have warned the lawyers that uh, this is a temporary scheme, and they cannot take decisions as real compliance managers they work in the previous paradigm, they will formulate the approaches. If you see that a certain operation is toxic, you might agree on it, only commenting that it is to be approved at the top. I don't think that is the most efficient procedure, but that uh, reflects the current situation. What procedure would be more efficient? That is option second. You can see a more detailed presentation of our structure, and you can see that one of the options when compliance can be inside the legal block. Uh, we are talking about independence, but today, according to the upper schema, show what kind of independence do we have here, and who is independent of whom I do not understand, because I think, on the contrary, that is a situation of legal indefiniteness. Uh, we have a corporate secretary in the legal block who reports to the board of directors, and no one argues against it. Uh, similarly, we uh, might uh, act with compliance. At the last slide, these are the questions which are facing us, and which 
uh, facing all of us, uh, our companies and our audience, what areas of compliance are topical and necessary for the company, are there uh, available resources for setting up an independent functional vertical of compliance? What qualification is necessary for that? How to ensure independence of compliance function in the company? And where is its place in the structure of the company? I think that it is possible to experiment and to discuss these uh, questions with us. Probably someone will formulate his opinion or present his experience. May I ask you? And briefly, compliance function, does it take a decision itself? Yes, it does. Thank you for your detailed presentation. Frankly speaking, I was going to ask a question on regulatory risk and the place in mitigation. But now I have another question after listening to your presentation. I have a problem with definition compliance. Uh, Anti-monopoly compliance appears, tax compliance appears. I might continue the list, compliance of Ross Technozor, compliance of subsurface use. Probably, my question is, where is the boundary? Should we restrict ourselves to anti-corruptive compliance, regulatory risk, divide them and uh, agree on it? Or should we expand the notion of compliance infinitely? And the law is... I won't be able to digest it. First, uh, we're just thinking about it. That's not uh, the situation so far. If you rem uh, rem remember the slide with errors, everything that we were doing was due to some external factors. They were not invented. As to tax compliance, as soon as we started horizontal monitoring, that problem arose. There are five companies in the country. As to anti-monopoly compliance, we haven't yet been discussing it, but we know that the main threat comes from them. What is the purpose of our activity? To keep more money in the company, not to pay penalties? What should be done? It depends not on the lawyers, it depends on the daily acting business leaders or their assistants. And then, how would we affect it, uh, either uh, other than through the procedures? As to Rostechnadzor, I think it is not important today, particularly when, when we're speaking about the system. It might become urgent when Rostechnadzor is treating us as anti-monopoly service, uh, then we'll think about it. Uh, let's uh, start with the sector. Ross Technozor for us is similar to uh, FES uh, for petroleum sector. As to FES and compliance, after the second wave of penalties, the business would think whether it is efficient. We we'll always draw the attention of the business. They have their performance indicators, and when they counted, it appeared that what they earned due to the uh, monopoly prices was paid as fines, as high fines for them. That was a discovery for business. After their business started talking with the lawyers, an important role in anti-monopoly compliance was played by GR, uh, which clearly feels uh, the mood in the region and understands the attitude of the governors and the social component of the services rendered, including prices for petroleum products, and two times a week, business, GR, and lawyers determined the prices for the regions, uh, what they have to do. And I think that in practice, uh, it, uh, it will be also used in Rosneft, because now the penalty on the turnover and making changes to the administrative code practically uh, means that you won't be able to pay, pay the minimum fine. If it is a question, I can answer. Yes. Yesterday I had negotiations with deputy head of the anti-monopoly service and asked him those uh, trading practices or policies on which you insist or which you propagate, uh, did, were they implemented? Yes, they have been implemented uh, now. And the creation of the trade policies of the companies 
Is it a first step uh, to set up a system of anti-monopoly compliance? This is what we are talking about, formalization of procedures and uh, marks for managers. We are just starting it. The first policy uh, was approved by 10 KDPs, so you were the pioneers in that field. May I uh, have a brief comment concerning Ross Technodzor compliance of surface use? In fact, I have an idea that probably compliance is good as a well operating legal function because. <laughs> my apologies. But Ross Technodzor which immediately comes to us unexpectedly and we cannot do anything is uh, also a legal problem or probably Rosnedra would come in respect of the deposit for which we can do nothing. That is also a legal problem. So we're speaking about the same thing. I would clarify that as an organization legal problem. I'll explain why. Because once we came across the problem of non-payment or unfair implementation of the contract by our counterparties, we started to analyze it, and in most cases, we were to blame. Uh, probably the letter was not sent uh, on time, uh, or the email aid was wrong, and we couldn't file the proceedings at the court, the law and, uh, court of law, and there was a question of administration of transaction. If we want to introduce compliance, we uh, have to have the organization technical instruments for controlling the behavior of the managers. Therefore, we are saying that the role of the law incre uh, increases, uh, not only to make inclusions, but to control the implementation of the transaction, because business often forgets about the transaction. Here, from we have the risks, so, so the compliance problem is an organizational legal problem. Just a comment. As you know, I would like to come back to my last remark. Since we have problems with definitions, and Alevtina mentioned that compliance is a borrowed word and uh, has a clear meaning, probably it would be useful to speak about regulatory risks and management of risks by the uh, lawyers and compliance is a function that was not formed in this country and mainly involves management of anti-corruption risks. That is my proposal, and I'm ready to give the floor to the next speaker, Olga Valtoj, Director of the Law Department of Interos Company. A good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'm in a difficult position. It is always difficult to take the floor of Ruslan because he has covered all the aspects. Actually, he hasn't answered the main question, the question of our today's discussion. Should we have compliance within the legal function or not? He said that uh, this answer will be shared by him uh, next year. Uh, that was just a joke. Frankly speaking, to be brief, uh, uh, just I would like to say that we all understand that today the legal profession and the role of the uh, uh, leader of the legal uh, departments has undergone a considerable change. It's not that we uh, dis divide our uh, working time between the managerial functions and just the legal uh, function. Uh, we have to uh, become strategists. Uh, so today, uh, I cannot say that GR or compliance uh, are so uh, acute uh, a, a problem faced, uh, facing our company. Some companies have already uh, may have already solved these issues for them. But uh, our topic uh, of the roundtable discussion was proactively chosen to anticipate uh, this problem. These uh, uh, trends have been borrowed and for, they're more interesting for public companies. For the companies, uh, the uh, uh, leaders of which have gone through the MBA courses. Uh, so almost all the um, uh, MBA 
attendants uh, begin to introduce new standards and borrow from the Western experience. So I'm not in taking uh, public companies for which uh, these new trends and new standards prove to be a, uh, an objective necessity. So as a result of today's roundtable discussion, I would like to understand uh, whether we can de derive a certain uh, general approach because we all work for our separate specific industries and branches of law. So each company has uh, its own leadership with its culture and its uh, visions uh, of the future, of the, the uh, uh, vision of the business future. So it would be interesting to understand whether today we could agree uh, between ourselves on a certain common denominators. Of course, underlying uh, uh, these directions, uh, areas of development, are specific skills and knowledge, and if the company wanted to introduce such structural departments. Uh, so these uh, departments uh, uh, should be, if not inside the legal function, so they would uh, clo work in close conjunction and interaction so that there is no opposition uh, between them. So I've uh, spoken to some of the leaders of the legal departments, heads of the legal departments, who introduced uh, dedic new dedicated uh, areas like compliance and others, and the staff members there. We know that it's a new area of activity and just new ambitions for staff members and others. So uh, uh, legal seminars were held, and of course, uh, legal department staff members would be invited to present at such. Mm, so uh, for us as uh, heads of uh, certain legal uh, departments and legal kind of branches, it's important to streamline um, uh, our activity and uh, derive the maximum benefit from this area so that uh, we have very good interaction with these uh, uh, departments, if not have them within the legal block. So I'm not speaking about, about GR. Because compliance or GR to an extent are a legal function. Uh, if we go beyond it, we'll get into a very specialist field. Speaking about GR, uh, I was part of many meetings when uh, you advocate some um, uh, draft uh, from the uh, legal standpoint, and people respond to you using legal argumentation, uh, political argumentation. Uh, so GR uh, is not fully a kind of. Uh, adjusted to the Russian soul. There are experts probably in this area, but uh, there are uh, legal representatives of the legal profession who can talk, who can speak both languages, the legal language and the political language. So we want to reserve GR, if we want to reserve GR for the legal uh, profession. Uh, so we also need to learn how to speak political language. So then I would briefly wrap up and uh, give more time for inter interventions for my colleagues. Uh, uh, thank you. The, uh, we are discussing whether GI is a legal or um, a non-legal function. Uh, the question, however, is a little bit different. Uh, uh, what is uh, what it is that we term as GR. So we cannot define it as a purely legal function. That would be a, a, an incorrect approach and unfair. So somewhere GI as a function is already formed, somewhere it is still being formed, and the functionality is being changed. Different companies adopt different approaches. Uh, so I wouldn't say that uh, there is too much of legality here. However, this is my p personal viewpoint. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, I might, may throw in a controversial uh, statement. Uh, 
uh, you, Igor, had a wonderful proposition uh, to get away from the borrowed abbreviations. Back in 1990s, when with the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union and just a huge amount of foreign commodities flooded the Russian market, and there was even a joke uh, about people who use foreign languages, uh, who buy T-shirts with... Um, uh, foreign uh, statements and without knowing what they mean. So when we translate compliance uh, as a kind of uh, uh, we need to, to strike uh, just a good balance in translation because uh, if we translate it uh, the way we do uh, we need to add a certain case to that further. So let us narrow probably uh, the discussion uh, because we are speaking about the positioning of what, of what we don't know what exactly and where we don't want to know exactly where. Thank you, Alevtina. So the next presenter, Maxim Kandiba, the director of the Pricewaterhouse uh, Cooper's Legal uh, Practice. So I'll borrow the microphone from Olga, otherwise uh, I will have to use mine, which is turned away from the audience. So um, today I'm uh, an odd bird in the flock, so to speak, because I represent uh, uh, an, an external lawyer. Uh, today and uh, even uh, uh, before uh, uh, just uh, beginning the session, Igor uh, said that uh, he had no nothing against external lawyers, but he spoke about the advantage of having in-house ones. However, I'm an external. Uh, so the strategy of uh, developing of legal forum is discussing room number one. Uh, the topics are overlapping, however, it's not by chance that I'm sitting on the panel of this uh, roundtable discussion. Uh, so I would like to share with you today uh, the following. So we are a legal company, a legal firm, PricewaterhouseCoopers. So we carried out a number of projects aiming at the optimization of the legal function. Some companies are, uh, have a very complex vertical integration, so we carried out a number of projects aiming at optimizing the legal function. Now we can share the results. So the op optimizing of the uh, legal function So where were I? Where was I at the very beginning? So optimizing the legal functions and process, which is a burning issue now. So we at uh, in PricewaterhouseCoopers have different uh, dis divisions, are auditing, uh, legal uh, counseling, and we also have consultations, uh, which is a wash with uh, swamped with uh, requests and is very much demanded by customers. Maybe that is a, a result of the crisis or post-crisis, whether if we haven't yet uh, passed through it. So, so minimizing costs is a good prerequisite for further growth of business and reducing uh, uh, the overall course, so to minimize cost, you have uh, as one uh, um, device, uh, just uh, re minimize the cost and just increase the IT and others. Uh, so our consultants are very uh, successfully carry out their function. So, for example, uh, a territory basically was cleaned by three janitors. Now our advisors say, well, just uh, three is too much, we we'll have to lay down one, but uh, their sweeps have to be more effective. 
so uh, this is what our business uh, consulting uh, uh, company uh, is doing so just uh, one company approached it uh, this is a vertically structured holding and they wanted to optimize the legal function and they followed the same metaphors, the quality of in-house in service uh, 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 should be maintained at a, at a reasonably high level so that it didn't aggravate and on the other hand cut uh, the number of staff working uh, in this field. Uh, our consultants uh, realized it was a sensitive issue and they involved us. Uh, thank God. So, and uh, then uh, the, the legal function, us, owned the project. And uh, the first project was. Uh, I'm trying to put the, the first slide on. Some, again, technical problem here. However, I would really very much like to have the slides because it's difficult to uh, retell what's in them. Okay, so what we did Thank God the first slide appeared. Uh, step one was to diagnose. Uh, we have uh, exercised the so-called spring cleaning uh, because we wanted uh, to uh, understand how the legal function was organized at this company. So we just uh, we found uh, some departments that were quite obvious, and just there were some departments where the legal function was included were to be searched hard. Uh, the classical department with legal function included. This is ownership uh, department, GR, uh, compliance, and um, uh, corporate activity corporate governance one. So these departments were not only uh, con uh, just tied up to the legal department, they were directly accountable to the general director and carried out some parallel activities. So just such structure is prone with overlapping functions. Uh, they do not embrace the legal function in all sectors and fields due to such structure and approach. To give, uh, so there were some defects uh, in internal uh, ser legal service, uh, uh, document approval uh, and uh, coordination took too much time. So the, uh, a lawyer uh, just uh, just drafts a, a treatise, and just the lawyer of the legal department does not just put his stamp on it, but feels the necessity to uh, redesign it, and it takes uh, more time and uh, more uh, interaction. So mm, uh, also lack of uh, control over costs. So we mentioned an anti-monopoly, anti-trust function of compliance. Uh, recently we were approached by a big company which is in media business and it was the compliance department people, internal control, that was uh, the, one, the ones who approached us. It was headed by an economist, a person from the legal department. They wanted us, the external uh, advisor, to mm, uh, just uh, design the, uh, a specific method of uh, checking the compliance with the antitrust uh, legislation. So we asked why they didn't ask uh, the same to do the same thing of the in-house uh, and uh, lawyer. And they say that just the, so the function basically was uh, referred directly to the general director and there was some competition arising which reduced the efficiency of the whole process. Uh, so uh, the starting point for us was that we took all the departments uh, where there was overlap of the legal function 
and try to uh, break it further uh, into sub-functions uh, to understand what to do with the elements of sub-functions that they have or can transfer somewhere else. And different companies, different departments could have been involved in that. Uh, so, for example, we took the GR department and just uh, internal audit uh, and we found some elements that were to be referred to the legal function, which was the job of the legal department. A little comment on GR. How to structure this function, whether it should be independent or accountable to the general director, or it should be fully referred to the legal department. Um, I think depending on the type of the company, uh, the, question, the answer to this question can vary. If we take a company, the activity of which is affected uh, considerably by the state, not speaking about the relationship with the uh, tax authorities, otherwise we'll include all the companies. Uh, but, for example, company dealing in um, electric, uh, electro energy uh, that uh, designs tariffs for services, or the companies that are engaged in natural deposits uh, use and instructions. So then on the market we see that GR function is quite strong uh, in itself. Uh, there is a, a legal component, uh, legal function component uh, in lawmaking, but uh, it's not uh, uh, sufficient to refer it fully to the legal department. So how next uh, we could uh, optimize the situation. So the physically, departments uh, remain where they were, uh, the way it was shown in the previous slide. Uh, apart from the legal function, they also have some non-legal uh, functionality uh, to them. So the legal function is further referred to the legal department and uh, what happens here is, is centralization of the legal function at the level of the legal department. Uh, so, but you have to stop in time before it's too late. Uh, some of the managers ask us to go further and identify the centralized legal function as, a, as an independent legal person who would engage who would engage in outsourcing activities and provide services for other companies, our recommendation never do that. Uh, recently, I had a discussion. Uh, there was the top manager of a major bank who I talked to, and he wanted to promote this idea very much, and nothing could stop him, even the idea that uh, if uh, so there was a third person created, so, so the bank secret and uh, access to bank uh, secret information and others, so it could not be resolved through legal means and uh, let alone some other minor problems that together may be of great significance to him. I know of any com don't know of any company who would physically outsource that service center, uh, but uh, as uh, from the big four, uh, G just G4, uh, we know a company, um, big four, that uh, took a decision uh, to give up a legal function at the, as a structural element uh, uh, and uh, transfer it to a separate uh, legal company. So the legal company will uh, render the service that the audit uh, auditor needs. So there were special rates and tariffs developed and logistics had been uh, thought through originally. In practice, it proved uh, unfeasible and didn't work out. 
because even if they involve uh, advi legal advisors that they just big four companies uh, uh, should not be uh, as uh, so the vol legal involvement should not be as an external consultant consultant it should be an ongoing um, cooperation and interaction with that so in other words uh, uh, what I'm driving at is that uh, it entails the increase in staff members at uh, uh, the legal department of uh, that company. Uh, so, if this com if this function is centralized, there might be some uh, it bring some improvements. So, so here we. Uh, specify uh, the situation with the departments which previously contained the legal function. Uh, so what refers to the legal function is fully redelegated to the legal department, or uh, there should be some effective and close cooperation and interaction between the legal department and business department. And just lastly, uh, the slide. Uh, about decision making. Uh, so, this is the beginning. Uh, uh, can I have this slide, please? So, this is a beginning of a long way because the most Im interesting things begin here. Uh, so, switching on to a new structure is a change and uh, it takes. Uh, some time and effort to exercise this change. So you have to overcome the natural uh, resistance from the uh, legal department uh, or to the, the, the just department leader and the general director leader. So now when you have to give up your legal function and just you have to refer to a legal department uh, may cause uh, kind of uh, tension and resistance. So, well, top management uh, can rely on two scenarios, so legal function. Uh, uh, so functions can be distributed between different areas, which is ineffective. And the centralizing uh, of this of the legal function, which is more e effective, it doesn't happen so in practice. However, uh, we uh, because uh, if the if just business uh, divisions. Uh, just uh, have better relations with the top management, but still, you know, you can uh, set, uh, you know, legal departments which will have centralized function. Of course, you need support from top management. It is feasible uh, to achieve what I'm talking about. And uh, of course, you have to take a lot of pains to support this um, project. So when we transfer an element of a legal function for a one major company, so the Department of Currency Control, before they uh, needed to exercise some legal function, and uh, there were some norms and regulations, uh, uh, and that required uh, some uh, purely legal interpretation, and they outsourced this. So, uh, as a result of structuring this legal interpretation function was uh, transferred to the legal department. So, what we did, we conducted some introductory seminars to the lawyers from the legal department who needed to get new expertise and uh, skills, uh, but there can be different, uh, uh, can be other strategies available. Uh, so this is a beginning of a long way. So after this re-delegation of the legal functions and optimization, uh, one can further uh, seek to in increase uh, efficiency. Mm, uh, so we often see on the market the service that includes IT, and we even 
uh, set up a joint group with our IT advisory. So we uh, just consult as how you can uh, just bring the legal function to a higher level and uh, increase efficiency and optimize its activity. Thank you. Thank you, Maxim, for your interesting presentation. This uh, external view. I have made two conclusions. This has been for the first time that I heard that a consultant uh, or just that uh, an external consultant is invited to the company to write the legal function for the company. So it's an interesting approach. And the, thi the second idea um, uh, was that a lot depends on what the company, what business the company is in, and under what conditions it operates, and uh, uh, hence uh, unification is a doubtful issue. So hence my question. Since the customer of this exercise was business, uh, so you had to double your functionality. And uh, did you manage to act as mediator between business and lawyers? Uh, just That's a good question. I hope I intrigued you with the information that I shared. As I said in Basel, that the business consultants uh, failed to find methods just to make three lawyers weep the floor like three ones. So initially, we had a different approach. So mm, you're lawyers yourself, so we are uh, the same blood, you and me. So that's why we approached it mm, uh, from our perspective, from your shoes, as the English expression goes. Uh, so we uh, realized that this approach is not for us. And uh, uh, we recommend the business not to decrease the number of lawyers, but to increase the number of lawyers. And uh, among other things, we undertook a certain analysis. We calculated median uh, on, for the whole market uh, and uh, median value of the whole market. And uh, well, the number of lawyers and the staff. And uh, the ratio, or this ratio in this particular company was lower than uh, the median for the industry. And that's why we decided not to touch uh, those valuable, high cost, high maintenance lawyers with rich experience. So when McKinsey uh, evaluated lawyers, I like this. Next time, I will invite lawyers to evaluate lawyers. So I can disclose this secret. In 2007 in Russia, in Gazprom Neft, they evaluated lawyers. Uh, it happened when I was uh, the staff of that company. And according to the results of that evaluation, they concluded that uh, the functionality must be expanded and the number of lawyers on the staff must be increased. And uh, for us, this outside uh, look was very important and this uh, ratio of the number of uh, managers per each lawyer, or, uh, and uh, then uh, that uh, gave a start for our uh, thinking as to how to improve this function. Okay, thank you very much for the compliment. Now you know who to turn to in case you start restructurization. Oh, no, no, it was not advertising. Uh, uh, it's a comment rather than a question. Uh, Northern Caucasus, let's say if. And uh, uh, it was uh, pleasant to hear that lawyers are engaged in all the f types of activities of the company. But if we bring this to absurdity, then uh, we can conclude that even taxi drivers must have legal education and be lawyers. So let's uh, try to achieve some common denominator. Uh, so formulation of norms is not GR. And uh, so suggestions for improving norms, it's uh, 
the function that lawyers have even now. Uh, uh, it's all about the internal relations within the company, relations between the legal department and the uh, top management. But now I'd like to go back to the idea expressed here. Yes, we do have compliance at all the stages in antitrust and in uh, taxation and uh, all other things. And uh, more often, compliance is not only a legal issue, but also it requires other types of more specific knowledge in other narrow fields. Uh, hence the question, should uh, the lawyer, a corporate lawyer, uh, be accountable for the advice he gives and the uh, effect of uh, this advice implemented? And uh, should he disclose information about violations of the law should he reveal any in the course of his uh, analysis and investigation. So this is my question. Well, first of all, thank you for bringing us down to earth quite timely, because uh, this was quite a good comment. But as for the borderlines, mm, uh, I'm absolutely against lawyers having a control function. And uh, uh, perhaps uh, many would disagree, but control function is not uh, a function for a lawyer to perform. Uh, now I'd like to give the floor over to Tatiana Kozmina, who represents OAO Promises Bank. So, okay, I'll use the microphone. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to make my presentation and to share, because for the banks, the issues discussed are of paramount importance, because compliance, GR, uh, risk management, legal risk management, um, they are developed, highly developed uh, functions, well regulated, with detailed rules. Uh, uh, issued by the central bank and uh, some other uh, supervisory bodies. Uh, so we have a long history, many year history in designing those functions and in interaction, in building interaction. Uh, could you please give me the remote control? Uh, I just wanted to comment uh, saying that the, the professions growing up uh, neighboring to lawyers, sometimes our feeling is that they are trying to take away our bread. Sometimes they try to make lawyers uh, work with risks, because if they identify legal risks, why not making a lawyer and main risk manager? But then compliance is uh, just everything, uh, compliance with any type of law. Uh, and uh, within such an environment, legal service uh, director must be proactive, assuming Mm, a very clear cut position. I agree with Ruslan about the evolution of the legal functionality within corporation, and uh, we had a similar uh, curve. And uh, yes, calling for pro proactivity is the right appeal. And uh, just there is a legal component in each of those functions and uh, an additional component, non-legal in nature. And uh, here we should uh, understand where the bone foundation is, what the core is and how to manage that and how those services should interact and be aligned in their activities. Mm, so I'll try to switch over to another slide and I'll start with my third slide. Uh, this is a fruit of a uh, very long dispute, internal dispute within our company. Uh, I'm convinced, oh no, this is the wrong slide. Uh -huh. One slide is missing. My core slide is missing. 
and the presentation. I've lost it now too. May I please have my presentation back? Somewhere I have a picture. Somewhere. Oh, missing. Sorry. So that was my best slide. So, but uh, in this discussion, uh, through this discussion, I arrived at the same, the following conclusion: the legal service it works on the exit and uh, and uh, input and output of the situation, but in the course of, uh, in the process of making transaction, we have compliance, risk management, and uh, talking about uh, what function lawyers have, especially uh, the input. Mm, that's uh, some standard agreements, some formats of documents based on which uh, uh, the, comp the business operates, designing checklists, m methods, uh, strategies, uh, roadmaps, met uh, risk matrix, and so on. Thus, lawyers set certain rules of the game. Because uh, this, this is the core difference between lawyer and compliance manager. And it is as follows. A lawyer knows and understands the norms, can evaluate it, can weigh the uh, risk, the legal risk. But compliance uh, manager may know about the existence of this or that norm, but uh, he or she is not capable to give any uh, assessment thereof within the legal framework. So the tree that I've depicted on this slide shows the functions that we've uh, uh, discussed. And they all grow from the legal norms, which is the trunk of the tree. And uh, could you please go back to the previous slide? Mm, it disappeared at all. So what I mean by compliance. Compliance, first and foremost, in the banking system. And uh, our, oh, here are, hallelujah, the slide is back. So within the banking system, uh, compliance is uh, a activity associated with risk minimization. Uh, through uh, implementation of sanctions uh, for the loss of business reputation, the risks that uh, uh, issue from the violations of the laws and norms and uh, rules of behavior on the market. So this is the essence of compliance for us. And you can see on this slide that um, in the beginning of the process, the beginning of the chain, Lawyers set the rules of the game for those who are on the implementation stage, mm, sort of uh, monitor the transaction for compliance and check it up for compliance. Then, uh, in the end of the chain, uh, the, uh, if the situation is good, then everybody earns some revenue or we get a serious problem and then lawyers are engaged in uh, dispute uh, with regulators, courts, and so on and so forth. Uh, and perhaps it's probably the battery or some, but is there anybody out there to help me with my slides? Mm. Wasted effort of making presentation. Oh, it started working. Okay, so this first slide uh, reflects all the existing functions 
and the majority thereof are overlapping. What I wanted to say by this slide is that compliance, risk management, corporate governance, it's kind of a put-through function. And uh, compliance is part of corporate culture because uh, uh, compliance function uh, uh, just is uh, performed by every employee in his or her job. But compliance managers, uh, they uh, sort of trace uh, following the rules of the game. They want everyone to have checklists and follow the rules. Same about risk manager. Risks uh, are not legal. Uh, there are not only legal risks. Uh, there are credit risks and currency risks and uh, other types of risks. Uh, they're highly relevant for banking. And it's another aspect of the risk management issue, creating mechanisms uh, for revealing those uh, risks. And it's also a put-through uh, thing, methodology. And uh, lawyers make uh, serious contributions into this uh, on the level of setting the rules. Nevertheless, I'm convinced that those functions are separate, uh, and there must be separate people uh, performing those. At the same time, I insist that um, uh, the uh, head uh, must be on the level of general counsel. Uh, the sort of uh, top lawyer in the bank, at least. What else I wanted to say? Uh, regarding um, the evolution. I had some thoughts about evolution. Uh, mm, so uh, my slide uh, is not as beautiful as yours, looking like a rocket. But in the beginning of the 90s, when lawyers I had the function of just revealing and describing risks. And uh, nowadays, lawyers not only reveal them, but they manage risks and they minimize legal risks. And uh, in this case, I disagree with Ruslan uh, when he spoke about uh, the third variant, about just uh, l lawyers telling how to do things. Because one thing is when the lawyer says that, uh, just tells everyone what options they are. And another thing is uh, decision-making and assuming legal risk. Mm, because before, this risk should be weighed on the level of the whole company, should be assessed uh, the acceptability of this risk level uh, in the, on the scale of the company as a whole. And uh, just one lawyer simply is simply incapable of doing that. Uh, well, as for legal service, uh, neither... Uh, Legal service, but where is your legal service? Hanging in space or what? No, there must be normal risk management. Where should it sit? Where? Well, risk management is an independent function, absolutely independent function that should uh, uh, cooperate with the legal function. Well, they only make the risk metrics. That's all they do. Maybe in your company it is like that, but not in our bank. In our bank, risk management uh, sets the foundation for the economic evaluation, for revealing economic risks, and also for, well, by the way, we can pass over to the next slide, which is about risk management. And in my bank, in our understanding, Risk management um, is about uh, just uh, estimating the acceptable risk level. And uh, it's not only about compliance with uh, legal norms, but uh, lawyers, when designing the product, uh, when the product is being designed, or uh, they try to design the optimal legal construct uh, that enables the business to earn money at minimum risk level. Then. Mm, this uh, department sends in information about potential risks and about occurring risks. And this is on the scale of the whole company. And then the whole company estimates the level and the acceptability level of those risks and uh, does, uh, makes recommendations as to whether we should alleviate those risk levels or just uh, go on. Mm, and um, 
Uh, among other things, we in our bank we cr cr made uh, lists of uh, legal risks and uh, decision-making matrices. Uh, uh, and uh, this matrix depends on the risk level, and uh, it can be on the level of uh, just an individual risk manager or the committee or the top management of the company, depending on the significance of that risk. And I believe that law, uh, lawyers uh, simply can't and shouldn't make decisions in such situations. Lawyers can make decisions about writing the list of risk and about the estimating the substantiality of the risk and about the feasibility of this risk. But as to how much it is going to cost and uh, how it is going to work out in the scale of the whole bank, it's a totally different set of tasks. I also wanted to show uh, how we organize uh, the governance. I'm not very happy about uh, the scheme. And um, uh, developing my function, um, uh, well, I was very uh, happy hearing the Pedal you see, uh, representative, uh, he, when he said that uh, maximum centralization is desirable for legal service. We do have centralized legal service, but at the same time, there are parallel functions that are uh, within the finance and risk block and uh, unit and uh, then we have director on corporate governance uh, separately, but we already have agreement about uh, corporate governance being subordinated to me. So, hmm. And I also wanted to show that actually, that's it. I have disclosed the secret of the control board. There are such functions in compliance and in risk management and GR which the laws do not fulfill and do not want and will not fulfill. For instance, in compliance, this is checking of the operations on revealing them in terms uh, of uh, counteracting legalization and uh, filing uh, the information transfer uh, monitoring, prevention of the conflict of interest in corporate management. This is communication with shareholders. We lawyers can look at ourselves, how often we agree to participate in negotiations, how often we agree to uh, do some technical work related with communications. Thus, a special function on corporate governance and interaction with members of the board of directors, a correspondence presentation of materials to them should be carried on. It might be independent because we have to work efficiently and I believe that the legal function and we as lawyers should engage in highly complicated professional matters and spend our time and gift at maximum for that and our basic knowledge. As to technical routine work, it should be packaged and transferred to the back office, to compliance and to other employees. And we have to focus on something that is very interesting and promote it. The only thing is that packaging of routine and standardization issues requires special gift and special people, but uh, I'm looking for such people and we're doing it. That's in fact the final version and uh, the picture which I'm trying to achieve uh, is my final goal. This means that the main lawyer uh, is the manager of the legal uh, unit, and under him, uh, in the legal unit, there are separate functions interacting between themselves, legal compliance, JAR, and corporate governance. This is a very ambitious project. And I think that many of us would like to engage it. That is uh, not related to some specific matters in which we are going to engage, but we are already doing it. 
My question is, uh, is related to risk, uh, risks. That is a very interesting theme. And therefore, I have two questions. First, who takes a decision on uh, the person who will manage the risk? Who will determine the degree of manageability of the risk? Uh, and at least one example, you said that you have compiled the metrics of legal risks, uh, examples of legal risks, if possible. I have developed the following system. For each trend of activity of the bank, there are lists of legal risks. For instance, let us take the simplest situation, uh, credit trend. In the credit trend, there is an assessment of the legal capacity and authority. There is an assessment, for instance, of the uh, uh, agreements corroborating their uh, title. we have certain legal structures and legal transactions, and within them we have a legal risk distributed. For instance, the capabil in the capability, no document is given that uh, corroborates uh, uh, that general director is taking this, uh, is assigned to this position. We uh, determine whether this uh, document is essential as uh, to a mortgage or collateral transactions, or collateral transactions in the mortgage, the land area, for instance, that that is being pledged is not distinguished as a single independent land plot, but it, pres it is present within a bigger field. Actually, this is possible only if we have some uh, major experience in, of working. And since drawing up uh, the list of the risk was done by lawyers who follow this activity on a daily basis, they revealed these typical situations. They standardized and weighted them. And that list of risks contains measures on minimizing the risks. So we have revealed them. And we are also saying what would be the level if that risk uh, will be minimized by the proposed methods. And further to these lists, we have matrices of, matrices of decision making. The risk is divided into high, medium, and low risk. As to the low risk, the decision can be taken by the managers of the department on the business lines as to the medium risk by the managers of the blocks of business lines, two or three persons. As to the high or maximum risk, it uh, will be uh, resolved by the committee or by the managing board. And for each trend of activity, uh, there are such matrices. Thank you. This might be a theme of a separate discussion. For instance, I would like to give uh, the example from my practice. This is the current activity of the lawyer, Tenka BP. I didn't have a single re legal risk at the end. Because if we create an illusion or a matrix of risk and to find the boundary between the risks and current activities, it is rather easy. I didn't have any risks and I felt comfortable. I can tell you where from I have taken it. One minute, please. Probably it is a bit boring, but actually, I was in London. Uh, I attended the training of the heads of legal services or financial organizations. Everything was rather boresome, and our teacher asked. Uh, there were about 30 persons, managers of legal services of the largest banks, investment funds, and the question was asked, please tell me, what is your relation with business? What are your relations with business? And uh, everyone uh, said that businesses are bad, we reveal the risks, but uh, they do not uh, take into account, they neglect the risks, and we have a lot of scandals. And uh, such a matrix of decision making is a question what should be done further? When a lawyer simply gives a resolution and writes that from what you want, the situation is like that, then the manager receives such a resolution uh, and says, uh, why have they written it and where should go with this? 
And that decision-making matrix is the question uh, where to go with all uh, these descriptions of the serious problems. No microphone. No risk management. We are discussing. Uh, just we have a lot to say about it, and essentially, as to our roundtable discussion today, Anton Ragachevsky Brewery Company Baltic, a very important theme is being discussed now. But it seems to me that uh, it is the end of the session. Many of you are tired, but I would like to tell you that uh, I was disillusioned a bit. We discuss the matters that are quite painful and acute and important. This is compliance, primary risk management, organizing, st organizing structures, who uh, should be subordinate to whom. Uh, from all these presentations and slides, unfortunately, I haven't seen the uh, intellectual property block that is highly important because our theme is radical shift in law's functionality. Take into account the importance of that trend. I think that probably many of us are in a certain trap of modern uh, fashions and articles and important because of the uh, uh, and costly trainings in London and the Washington. But this block of intellectual property is necessary uh, under the radical shift in functionality. We have focus on it. If we uh, analyze all the assets on the globe, the share of the intellectual property assets is increasing at a high rate, and we shouldn't forget about it. I can make a comment. Probably we couldn't see our pre you couldn't see our presentation. At the very beginning, we spoke about uh, um, uh, principle and the basic principles of the pyramid. We have intellectual property. If we come back to that presentation, we have operational activity, current activity, what we are doing, then corporate governance, um, management of assets, what we should do being public companies, and third is intellectual property. Without it, not a single sphere would be able to operate, so it's a pity that this question was asked. We haven't admitted it. That ranks third. I think that the answer is quite simple. There is no concentration of attention on that problem because most of the attendees have uh, made their choice and they assigned the intellectual property to the sphere of activity of a legal service. And it is so obvious that no one is speaking about it because compliance is uh, more uh, topical theme. Intellectual property could be discussed 10 years ago, but not now. Now everyone has found an answer to that question, and it is not being debated. I would like to give the floor to my colleague, uh, who uh, works in the same sector, uh, to Rena Nerman, who is head of the legal department of Shell OEC. Does it shine? It doesn't shine. Is it shining? You can hear me. Thank you very much, um, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it is very an honor and a pleasure to be here for me with so many corporate lawyers, um, which of course, not being a Russian lawyer, not being a, being a corporate lawyer, maybe not a Russian corporate lawyer, it's so great to see this profession blossoming and so many people so active in this, uh, in this field. So it's really a great um, opportunity and a great honor for me to be here. I've been told I should never start a presentation with an apology. I will nevertheless do so. Uh, two apologies. One, I cannot address you in Russian because my Russian is by far not up to that. And I'm sorry, it should have been, but it isn't. Second one, in Shell, we say you can recognize somebody by which function he is by the slides he presents. Um, I have very, very simple slides because lawyers make very, very simple slides in Shell. Um, I'm nowhere near to the sophistication of the slides I've seen today. Um, had I known, I would have put a bit more effort into it. So. I'm, 
Okay, let me start off by translating what I thought the topic or think the topic is of today's session into my own words. I think what it says, basically what should be the role, the responsibility and accountability of the legal function or the legal department, the corporate legal function, the corporate legal de department in nowadays world. I'm very happy and I'm pleased to share some thoughts of how we in Shell have tackle that issue, at least for the moment, because it is an issue and a question which I'm sure we have all, as a profession, struggled with the last 10 years, and we will continue to struggle with it. And the reason for that is, well, there are many reasons, but one of the reasons is that the legal world is changing rapidly, and even more rapidly every day. There are new laws, there's a global economy coming on, Every country tries to make its mark on the legal regulations you're, you're subject to. It all interconnected nowadays. There is an enormous amount of information coming our way every day, which we have to process as lawyers and comply with. If I look at my very simple outfit here in Russia, our very simple outfit in Russia, we have a number of joint ventures. One of the joint ventures is a Dutch company, so subject to Dutch law. One is the Bermuda company, so subject to Bermuda law. Um, then, of course, or we operate in Russia, so everything we do is subject to Russian law. Royal Dutch Shell is a UK company. We're subject to English law, but we're, fortunately, as some other people are, on the New York Stock Exchange. So for a number of laws, we're subject to US laws. That those issues, those questions and the topics arrive every day on my desk. And my clients expect, of course, rightfully so, or my colleagues, that I'm an expert in all of these, which I'm easy to say, I'm not. So I just fly, as we call it, by the skin of our pants and pray every day that I have missed something, some new law somewhere, some latest president, and go to bed and think, oh my God, Let's this day be okay and tomorrow even better. But okay, how do we do that? Um, I, can somebody operate my slides, please? Uh, or give me the, 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 the little thingy which is you need apparently to... Ah, right. Now, in Shell, and going back, and I, I was glad to hear that the chairman, I think one of the other my, or colleagues um, mentioned that. Let's go back to basics a little bit before we, when we talk about this. If we talk about the legal function and what it should do, let's be clear, and in Shell we have gone through an enormous effort for every function, every department to map out the accountabilities, the roles and deliverables, and make sure that we understand who is responsible and thereby accountable for what. Because, and we had a, a, a question about the legal profession. In the end of the day, we work for a company. We're not independent lawyers. We are and have duties to our company. And those duties relate to if you miss something, and the question was asked, what happens if you give faulty advice? In Shell, you can do that once, presumably, as a lawyer, and you get spoken to. You do it twice, you get very seriously spoken to. And the third time, you will be asked to pack your bags and go somewhere else. And that's the consequence of not doing your job properly. Now, there are parts of your job where you provide advice, but somebody else is accountable. And we talked about, for instance, compliance. Now, in Shell, lawyers are not accountable for compliance. And thanks God for that, from my point of view. Because I have no, and my colleagues, no ability to control what some kind of guy is doing in Nigeria who imports valves from Russia and just forgets to pay the export duties in Russia. How am I supposed to know to influence? But if I'm accountable, one, I will be fired, most likely. Secondly, I may go to jail on the various laws which we are subject to. 
So I'm very glad I'm not. And that's, in every time we discuss, at least from my point of view, where accountability sits and what the lawyers do, that is something we need to keep in the back of our mind and think about. Can you actually deliver? If you're accountable and responsible, you need to take the decisions, that was mentioned, thank you very much for that, need to take the decisions and then you're accountable for that decision. Now what do lawyers do in Shell? I wrote it down there in my very simple slide. We are accountable, of course, for provision legal advice on any legal advice, any law, anything related to contracts, everything else, we provide advice. We're accountable for legal support to further business objectives. That's the catch-all phrase which allows me largely to stick my nose into anything in Shell to give support, advice, a comment, a suggestion, an observation, but it's part of my remit so I can do that, but I'm not accountable for it. And I'm accountable, that's where I'm accountable for, protecting the legitimate shareholder interest. That presumably translate in Russian, so it's also a matter of definition, of course, what you call what. That presumably accounts to the corporate service, or the, cor the corporate governance to some extent, but the corporate function, the shareholder issues, etc., etc. It also allows me, for instance, to whistle blow. For a company like Shell on the stock market, your reputation is extremely important. How to dent, and that's a mild word, not to say destroy your reputation nowadays world for an international company is to be non-compliant with laws and regulations to have your name in the newspaper. Shell fined $50 million for corruption in Nigeria. It happened. If I see something, I have a duty to first of all whistleblow in Shell, and if not, that doesn't work, you can argue, we talked about Sarbanes Oxley, SOX, thank you very much, under which lawyers have a special obligation to report violations with US laws. Now, for most of you that will not apply, it does for me because Shell happens to be on the New York Stock Exchange. The flip side most likely is if I don't and something goes wrong and I go next year to holiday on the United States, there is a fair chance that there will be this big hand when I enter the, new, the U US and said, Mr. Neymar, would you please come with us for a second? And that may be long seconds. So I better make sure, and all of you, by the way, that we do what we're supposed to do. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Now, so in short, as I said, we define and agree is accountable for what? We are accountable for delivery and legal advice to further business objectives. Now, we talked about compliance, governance relations, and overall risk management, or legal risk management. Some words on how we manage that in Shell, just to give you some thoughts how you could do that. Compliance in Shell is a business responsibility or accountability. As I said, thanks God for that, because you should put your accountability there where you can influence, control, monitor, govern, and whatever you words you want to give it, that, that's where it should be. Now, but what do we do? There is a compliance organization in Shell, which is a separate part of legal, so we have the legal function, and IP by the way, just don't worry, there is legal, IP, and compliance. Compliance, together with legal, is an enabler. We ensure that the company has the knowledge and the tools that it can comply. We give the advice it requires that it can comply. In Shell, it's very simple. There's a golden rule. We comply with the laws. Not doing so is what we would call a sackable offense. How we do, how we enforce that, it says if you encounter a legal issue or a compliance issue, thou shall ask legal advice. Not doing so is breaking a shell rule and means that you violated one of the key principles, could have violated one of the key principles of shell. That's the way we have structured that. The compliance organization ensures that the business has the tools 
the knowledge and gets the advice it needs to be able to comply. Whether it then does it, and I hope it does, but when it, that's a business decision in the end of the day, and thereby a business accountability. Um, can we have the next slide? Oh, sorry, just, just some words. Can I, sorry, go back. Government relations, that's a matter of definition from my point of view. We see government relations as a very broad. It's lobbying, it is calling, I assume, the presidential administration that Mr. Peter Voser, our CEO, would very much like to see Mr. The, of the, the, the president, if at all possible, um, seeing the, the Mr. Miller, the head of Gazprom, when could he see or be available? That is all what we call government relationship. Part of that is indeed new monitoring, new regulations, and new laws. It is under government relations, but it's clearly somewhere where lawyers play a most important role. If there are discussions ongoing on new laws, we see people from the Duma or the ministries about new laws and regulations, lawyers are present and will do the talking. Not me, of course, but my Russian lawyers will do that. I mean, that's presumably much more effective. Overall risk management, again, a business responsibility. We talk, I don't want to go into risk matrix because we could be stuck for hours, I appreciate that, but I am responsible, or we lawyers, to feed in proactively the legal risks in anything Shell does and where we get involved in. It is then for the business to ensure that that is acted upon. I'm responsible for giving the mitigations. I'm also responsible, by the way, for when the business does not do what it's supposed to do, or what I think it's supposed to do, to follow up on that. Up to a moment in time, I've been told at sufficiently high level that I should, in very polite English terms, shut up and mind my own business. Now, fine, that's what I then do, unless it's clearly a violation of the mm. law or something which will harm a reputation. I will take that up. Can I have the next slide, please? <coughs> Um, next slide, next, yes. Now, how do we think we have managed that in Shell? In Shell, we fought long and hard for it. Legal is independent. There, every lawyer in Shell reports into a lawyer. Only the, what we call the legal director, that by, the way, by the way, we have about 1,000 lawyers in Shell, so there are quite a lot of them. Um, only the legal director reports into the CEO. He is the man, he's on the board, the board of directors. But yeah, somebody has to be the boss in a company that happens to be the CEO. So yeah, that's where the, the, last, the last lawyer standing reports into. No, well, sometimes, I hope. <laughs> but uh, otherwise, from the legal director all the way through, um, I was about to say the lowest lawyer, but that can't be true for lawyers, of course, there are no low, low lawyers, but to every lawyer in Shell, there is a lawyer who he reports into. That ensures that we are never subject to undue influence of non-lawyers. My staff report, my salary, my bonus, I get all that, is decided by my legal boss. And the more the business hates me on occasions, the better it is because I've done a proper job by keeping them on the straight and narrow. Now, so that's what, the second thing what we do, and that slightly contradicts that they hate me, they don't by the way, is that we try to be a business partner. The legal organization in Shell exactly mirrors the business organization. There is no, no staff, no operator who's more than, you would say, a click, but a corridor or a phone call, well, that's always easy, but in his own organization, away from a lawyer where he can go to and ask. Lawyers sit in every leadership team in Shell. They partake in every important, and, and the important depending on the level of your organization, decision being made. If Shell Russia decides to make an investment, decides to this invest decides to do something which is slightly more than the colors of a pen, I will sit in that meeting in which that is decided. 
Now, half the time it's about shall we drill one wells or two wells, which formation, and I sit there and think, okay, I mean, fine, great, lovely, I mean, learn something. And occasionally I say, mm, have we thought about that? And they say, either yes or no, or something they say no. I thought, okay, let me l give you the lay of the land. Which are the boundaries of your decision here? And occasionally I have to say, sorry, you can't do that. Now, that's of course a position where no lawyer really would like to be in. The, the third thing what we try to do, or the fourth thing is, ensure that you always have a solution. A lawyer in my department or in Shell who says to the business, no, you can't do, and then is asked the question, but what can we do? And says, don't know, not my problem, will not make a great career in Shell. And that's where you gain the trust from the business, and thereby they will listen to you, at least in general. I mean, we all know that sometimes it doesn't work that way, but in general, these are the things, the two most important rules in Shell, which allow us to be effective. So the question was, was there an alternative to, um, I mean, if you read the, the topic of the session, I think, we think there is. We play, we feel, a very important, if not crucial role in Shell, but we do not have the accountability where we cannot execute that accountability. I think that's what we all should strive to. Now, it's different maybe for Russian companies, I appreciate that. You look at the world differently, you have different problems than we have, of course, but some food for thoughts of how we do it in Shell, and I'm very happy to discuss this and share this further with you. And thank you very much for listening to me. Ну, вот во второй части мы наконец-то услышали такой более взвешенный, адекватный подход к юридической профессии, к юридической функции. Аппетит, очевидно, очевидно меньше, чем у предыдущего выступающего. Вот. Для меня ничего нового, потому что я в свое время через все это прошел, общаясь с BP, примерно такой же функционал, так, примерно такие же взгляды. Но нужно сказать, что это результат, опять же, достаточно серьезного, длительного генезиса и развития функций в таких крупных нефтяных компаниях. Просто те вопросы, которые мы сегодня себе задаем здесь, на этом форуме, там были заданы значительно раньше, и ответы на эти вопросы были получены значительно раньше. Поэтому, поэтому мы сегодня услышали такой достаточно уверенный. Looking at this presentation, thank you very much for that, Mr. Naimea. I see a lot of similarities with the company which I represent because all multinational companies work in Russia share one and the same kind of, you know, foundation because they are headquartered in Europe or in the United States, like in my case. Uh, but uh, we all have one and the same type of uh, instructions and directives uh, and the vision of uh, our American and European colleagues is very similar. However, what Igor just said about such a long genesis, uh, long evolution over time, because the Europe and the United States did not develop in the kind of a Soviet regime, but for a longer, longer time. Uh, what we have now is the consequences of our own mentality and the impossibility of our business to be held accountable for compliance function. You said that uh, you see view compliance function as a business because business is accountable. Uh, uh, so they, uh, they uh, seek to be compliant right from the outset. In our case, uh, there is a little bit different view of business, which is not always compliant. And as uh, lawyers, uh, as a commun legal community, we feel uh, more responsible and accountable ourselves 
uh, to make it uh, change and just uh, we want our country and our legal profession to develop following a different way we want business to be mm, different we want to change it hence we are more prepared just one moment let me finish and I'll give you the microphone we are ready uh, and prepared in our functionality to undertake this uh, goal uh, maybe not uh, all of us who had the le uh, legal departments thought through the prism of Nigeria. So maybe if we were to be held criminally liable, like in Nigeria, we would have uh, probably changed our mind and said, well, uh, compliance is not our responsibility, at least not the way it is done in Nigeria. Uh, but. Uh, uh, we, knowing better uh, regulatory risks and business risks, uh, we, uh, we can best uh, synthesize uh, and unify this information and then uh, render necessary assistance to the business uh, for it to develop better, being business partners. So it was just a comment. Um, it, because this is an ongoing dialogue, if not war, uh, internationally, when inside your company you try to show and explain this vision to your European and American colleagues to uh, inform them about the different views uh, uh, on the compliance on that side and on the other side. Thank you very much for a very good comment. I just wanted to very briefly add that one needs to take into account the Russian legal field. Uh, so if we compare the uh, Russian and uh, European and uh, uh, American legislation, we work in a uh, kind of a, a very explosive situation with low a degree of percent, uh, uh, predictability. We don't know how the norms are going further to be developed or changed, so it requires maximum involvement of lawyers uh, right from this set. Mm. So, can I make two small comments? I mean, I appreciate, and I apologize for saying that because not being a Russian, um, I appreciate that compliance, and particularly bribery and corruption, and the way some people, some, a vast minority will look at this, it's different than in other countries. I mean, apparently, allegedly, that's the case. The one thing you can do, first of all, in compliance, and that's, but it's not about compliance, but otherwise I could give you a lecture for an hour, tone of the top is the most important thing. If you do not have your senior management with you, you will always lose that battle. That's where you should start, but educating them and scare them to death. I had, a, sorry, if I have two seconds. I had an, we were completely different. I worked in the Middle East and I had, we had a joint venture in Syria and I had a session with the Syrian Minister of Oil who just told him that American laws were of no concern to him whatsoever and he could forget it. And he was the general manager of the joint venture in name. He said, fine, Mr. Naima, you wasted your time. I said, and the same I said, just, do you, have, do you have relatives in the United States? How often do you visit them? Well, two, three times a year. I said, well, you better stop doing that if you think that way. And then he said, okay, tell me what I should do. So there are ways to get people's attention, unfortunately. You should be a role model in that battle or I don't know whether that's the right word, you should be a role model and trying to do the things you're supposed to do or companies are supposed to do. One, secondly, so turn from top, secondly, be close to your people, be close to your company, to the business people. If you do that, they will share with you and you will have the opportunity to say, well, why don't we do that differently? Or maybe that's not the right way of doing it. And that is be a partner. Be, don't be the lawyer who stands up, you can't do that. But said, sit down with them, go to your business meetings and talk to them. I said, what's going on? What's happening? What are your issues? Any blockers, any problems? Sorry, that was what I want, want to share. Uh, Anna Syria, bring a megaphone. I want to make a comment. 
uh, I don't have a global boss. Uh, I'm the chief lawyer in my company, so I face very similar issues and problems. Uh, so what it is that is to be included in the legal professor, uh, profession or not? I like the description, a classical description of the legal profession given by Mr. Neymar, uh, because I combine in my position GI and uh, compliance uh, I uh, asked myself uh, whether it was uh, inherent uh, component for the legal profession. Was it? Uh, uh, I thought that GI was a logical outgrowth of the legal profession. Now, having been involved in it for two years, I understand that this is quite a different function, as well as compliance. This is not a legal function in classical uh, no in enclosure. Its alignment of interests is support for the business client and uh, joint decision making what com uh, uh, but beat compliance or gr both are separate functions uh, we have business customers and we um, uh, just uh, work to its to his order in the classical function so when we work with compliance and gr we set objectives ourselves we uh, involve uh, supporters and partners and try to achieve these goals i think good news is that the legal profession is quite a, a, a young and growing professor so in-house lawyers grow and develop with this uh, profession and it depends on us if we can effectively combine the legal support function, the classical function, or uh, other functions, be it GR or compliance, but we should not delude ourselves in thinking that these would be logical outgrowth of the legal function. These are just our ambitions if you do well in that field in your corporations. But uh, I congratulate you, but you shouldn't say that one is an outgrowth from another. At the very beginning of our discussion, I thought, and we talked about it last year, uh, we wanted to involve compliance and GR representatives here, but this is a legal forum. Uh, but we will maybe uh, do that next year. We will select uh, keynote speakers who could um, um, argue with um, uh, but we uh, wouldn't understand, uh, convince Mr. Naimeo so that he could embrace compliance. So Olga Fomenich, uh, director of the legal department of Coca-Cola Russia, the next speaker. So I uh, have an, if an honorary function of closing or being the last but one speaker for this section session maybe people already uh, anticipate the gala dinner with a snow show so i thought how i could restructure my presentation not to repeat what has already been said by the previous speakers because so much has been said that even during this session i kind of uh, changed some of my ideas uh, with which i came here originally so i will speak about the compliance function in our company how it is organized in practice and probably share some of my some of our um, uh, ideas. I'm not going to press the buttons and exercise the remote control, uh, and but I'll just tell you things. The compliance uh, has been established as a function uh, a long time ago. We started off being an anti-corruption concise, uh, just. Uh, meeting all the Oxley and other requirements. So it was within the legal function uh, that was Coca-Cola has uh, a number of areas within the legal function, uh, M&A, intellectual property, uh, antitrust uh, regu uh, compliance, uh, the f a function that is responsible for legal support uh, of uh, Working companies, so it was one of the areas within it. At the level of cooperation, uh, there is a function of compliance uh, that is accountable to the chief compliance officer, who is uh, accountable further to the general counsel. Mm, and there are a number of uh, experts uh, that at the global corporate level are engaged in designing and developing the de instruments that make the compliance program. And here, 
I would like to just offer uh, what we understand under compliance, share our definition. So in my presentation, speaking of compliance, I'm going to speak about a set of instruments, policies, procedures and programs that help the company uh, just comply with the current legislation, both uh, applicable local and international legislation, or the, and just the business ethics norms as well. So compliance uh, with the legal legislation is not in function. I'm not. Uh, this is a routine uh, activity of us as physical persons, of citizens, of us as professionals and companies. So a taxi driver carrying out his function should uh, comply with the applicable legislation in, in his situation as well as the physician uh, who also uh, needs to comply with the requirements of the applicable medical legislation. Compliance as function, as we speak about it, uh, accumulates a set of instruments that help to ensure this, compli this kind of um, compliance with the legislation. So, so the, uh, the chief compliance officer uh, uh, oversees it, uh, and just uh, all these policies, uh, uh, methods, and programs are devised uh, with involvement of experts uh, while developing antitrust legislation. We involve the group that is uh, responsible for antitrust compliance and legislation. Uh, so it also uh, includes the uh, just you know positions of the uh, lawyers uh, on site. So it also includes technical, financial experts. Why? Because this function uh, develops methods not only for lawyers but also for auditors, for internal auditors of the company, some technical programs and uh, means, because we have an online tool, for example, that uh, uh, has to approve certain procedures or interaction with state bodies or conflict of interests and others. So a corporation uh, develops these methods as well as trainings that are necessary in order to try just to communicate this knowledge to the staff members and even mm, implementing this training programs. We have uh, online trainings or just uh, ordinary trainings. This also com company also deals in audit in terms of the anti-corruption uh, policy compliance and just the breaches of the ethical code of conduct or uh, anti-corruption policy and anti-monopoly policies and other major policies. The major investigations are carried out at the level of cooperation. And then, uh, uh, so this big cluster within this legal service um, carries out its activities through people on site, uh, on the ground. Uh, these are the lawyers of business departments. Uh, so legal uh, heads of the business mm, divisions are managers for business ethics. So compliance issues all boil down to him. So implementing all the methods that the company introduces and control over this implementation. Such a system works mm, quite successfully because compliance as a function grows with time and I think some dedicated compliance uh, managers uh, on uh, corporate ethic, business ethic will be introduced, but within uh, the legal function. Uh, we think it, uh, because this uh, function requires specialist knowledge even to implement the programs and policies mm and uh, legal uh, methods that were uh, de developed in the corporation to, to enforce them. Uh, in this situation, people resort to lawyers because without knowing law and its legal principles, no one can interpret a situation correctly. For example, somebody approaches me and asks, uh, 
uh, can we make a donation uh, for a program at school, for example, at the request of the municipal local municipality? Uh, and you have to analyze not only the anti-corruption viewpoint, whether it's support for school education or it's some business goals that you are pursuing, whether there is a corruption component. And it is necessary to analyze the norms uh, and policies and procedures of the company. Can a non-lawyer perform such an analysis? Uh, we discussed this uh, with Rene. Uh, and uh, compliance officer comes to the lawyer for a consultation in a similar situation. Only upon this consultation, it uh, gets down to implementation. I don't uh, know whether this business model effective. Uh, with us, uh, uh, it requires additional responsibility, uh, and probably it will be singled out into a separate resource or a cluster, but it requires people who have to have very specialist expertise, knowledge and qualification, which is self-evident. I want to refer it all to Aleftina's presentation, who said that ex compliance experts uh, uh, do not have any qualification requirements. Uh, just, but, uh, I, uh, whether you will have it within the legal function or outside it, Anyway, this should be a function which will be uh, a legally centric function. Uh, and uh, considering uh, Maria Abramova's experience, you can enclose uh, some functions within the legal uh, uh, function because uh, everything should be uh, part of a single strategy and consistent. Uh, so we can be, uh, we, we, they should can impose some legislative principles of, on how about how it should be. But uh, practically speaking, I think the most reasonable way to go about it is to build it within the legal function. Uh, so uh, for major big companies uh, to build it within the legal uh, department. Uh, or you can integrate it into the uh, legal departments uh, on the ground, so people uh, responsible for compliance they should be and can be part of the legal function anyway. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that the legal functionality is changing, uh, uh, shifting from service uh, rendering to partnership in business. So when we speak about partnership and a leader, we can uh, not avoid responsibility because my boss cannot does not ask me for a recommendation. He asks me for a decision. So when I write my objectives, uh, uh, he says, I want you to propose a solution and uh, we will be responsible about, for, for it together and we'll work to achieve it. For me, it's a kind of a revolution. So we also have similar cases, uh, and I uh, always uh, I'm always surprised when there's a uh, just a construction director uh, wants to give a donation to the local school in order to solve his construction problems, and uh, you look uh, him in the eyes and say, "Don't you understand that this is a kind of a bribe that is being extracted out of you? Do you need a lawyer to explain this, or can you understand it yourself?" He can ask this question, but all reasonable people in business, all educated ones, know and can do this, uh, uh, can understand the ethical uh, 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 kind of dimension of it, and just, uh, uh, just it is silly to think that uh, uh, lawyers will uh, prohibit you to do something because of the compliance issue. I would agree with you to an extent, and I could argue with you to another extent, because it's not shifting of the responsibility, but it's expertise. I understand that something is wrong here. Maybe it's unethical or maybe it's legal, because I'm not a lawyer. I don't know. Can I do what is non-ethical and illegal? People who don't have the vision 
in following your logic, criminal liability uh, only threatens lawyers because all the other people are not in a position to fully understand what they are doing. Including, yes, to explain and to um, support and just uh, to provide certain resources for that. So I'll wrap up at that. And I think that today this uh, integrated business navigation calls uh, for an extended functionality and it's been difficult to remain within the classical model that we are used to, even if you wish. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Правильно ли я понял о том, что в принципе то, что сказал Руслан Султанович, пока это касается только пяти, но может быть там не знаю, пятидесяти компаний? If five companies, this horizontal monitoring and compliance and well, compliance to SOX or UK Bribery Act to what? So this is first question. And number two. Are we threatened in Russia uh, with this? Because you do your GR. Uh, so uh, what about the probability of laws, uh, socks like to emerge in Russia? Who are you addressing this question to? Well, OK, mm, five companies. It's only those five companies who signed an agreement on horizontal monitoring. And in this regard, we raised the issue. In this case, probably we won't have time to correct our mistakes in uh, filling out our tax return. Only this is what uh, my message was about, because uh, SOX laws and other things, well, all the companies uh, have to comply with that eligible companies. As for the reality of this threat for Russia, I can say that, uh, well, when anti-corruption law was, or corruption prevention law was adopted, it said that um, the companies should undertake measures to create uh, anti-corruption, anti-systems. Uh, this, is, this means that the first step has already been made. I see one more question out there. Dear colleagues, it's a very general uh, question. I am professor of the uh, High School of Economics. So this issue was not touched upon in your presentations because probably this issue is not uh, very relevant for the companies you represent. But this anti-corruption compliance and the existing uh, in banks, insurance companies, and in many other member participants of the government, certain systems uh, against uh, corruption and uh, money laundering. Do you think that anti-corruption compliance should be a separate function, or it should be uh, these two functions, uh, money laundering and anti-corruption? Should they be merged together, or should they be separate functions? So I think that that still remains uh, untouched. Well, thank you for your question, but they are two different functions, but still they fall under the compliance category. And at least in our bank, we do compliance by means of, uh, just, well, or through the operations of a variety of units. And uh, money laundering, uh, it's uh, just uh, for one of the units, and uh, uh, corruption prevention. It's uh, a different, a separate function that is dispersed throughout several businesses. Well, not business, but units. It's a safety department and legal department. But uh, as Coca-Cola lady said, a compliance function is about uh, creating methodologies. But uh, implementation uh, should be on the level of each uh, employee. So um, as for legalization, uh, there is special service, there is a special service, but every bank employee, in case uh, he or she sees some doubtful uh, operation, should inform about that. 
And we have the last speaker for today, Denis Nikienko, director of Lossiburg Company, uh, legal department Lossiburg Company. Well, thank you. I want to thank Mr. Reiner. I can smell oil in the air. And uh, I work in downstream business. Uh, and uh, still, I would like to continue or just follow up on the theme raised by Mr. Reiner. Mm, with the permission uh, of the audience, I will uh, project my first slide. And mm, I would like to quote a very well-known uh, poet in Russia, Yevtushenko, who once said that a poet in Russia is more than poet, teacher is more than a teacher, musician is more than a musician. And I believe that, in fact, mm, a lawyer in Russia is more than a lawyer. A lawyer in Russia, uh, and not only in Russia, in other countries of the world too. And uh, we uh, perform this service function, but we are something more, or we can and should be something more. Uh, we, shall, uh, we should get rid of this uh, kind of attitude. I doubt that we should really claim uh, new horizons, new uh, heights. Probably we'd rather work better within the functionality that we have. So in 2010, what has, was done in Sibur? Uh, in legal department, we had very broad functions. At the same time, we had uh, many people on the staff. Uh, 40,000 employees as the personnel of Sibur, but uh, we had one lawyer per every 200 employees. If we look at the experience of uh, foreign countries, it's different. Dow Chemical, one lawyer per 330. Dugmon, one per 333. Chevron, one per 380. Pfizer, one per 280. But uh, now let us... Uh, mm, consider the issue of our functionality, mm, not from the perspective of the function director who Rollins uh, Nolens wants to expand his uh, power, but from the position of CEO or a stockholder, the owner of the company. Uh, lawyers, they are service function. It's a cost center. Whatever we might claim, but uh, there's a thick book from DuPont that uh, proves, provides evidence to uh, this uh, thesis. So we are this uh, cost center. So what do stockholders think about that? Why increasing the number of lawyers and increasing costs if the company has some other units or services? Why having internal audit? Why having economic safety department? Uh, I'd like to use the next slide to illustrate how Sibur approaches uh, these issues. Number one, we have a very clear-cut uh, functional specialization of functions. Uh, lawyers specialize only on uh, uh, specific issues. Mm, some on audit, some on safety, some on environmental issues, some on uh, production safety and all that. So they all have the curating lawyers, all those uh, functions, and they are functional leaders of the functions. Uh, secondly, we have this uh, rigid specialization. Lawyers work only on their profile tasks, courts, agreements, current issues, uh, and all that. Also, we uh, 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 participate in GR activity using the terminology uh, that I heard here. But as for GR activity, we uh, do it realizing that it is the government uh, bodies and agencies that create norms. We can only have a consultancy or just force, or just we can give recommendations and suggestions, or we can just try to defend the interests of our companies in the 
dialogue with the government. But we can't assume GR on ourselves. We can't uh, organize a uh, prime minister visit. We, uh, whatever we may say, we're just down with interpersonal relations and all that. But uh, this is impossible. Mr. Reiner mentioned relationship with the president at Berlin Station. But uh, if we don't know names, we will be losers if we start GR. Uh, said, uh, if we try to invite Prime Minister of the Russian Federation or any other federation for the inauguration of our major new production line without knowing his name, well, we're doomed for failure. Uh, the third thing is that we uh, just uh, give lawyers new powers only when um, those powers are not kind of uh, assumed by some other uh, departments. I'll give you two examples to explain what I mean. My slide five is about that. How, uh, it's about the genesis of uh, uh, a typical for a lawyer functionality. Uh, the first case is about the conflict of interest uh, between the employees of the company. Broad scope of issues, it's uh, probably uh, some have uh, re relatives working in competing business and uh, all other cases through fraud. Of course, we have to uh, monitor and somehow regulate this thing. The tools provided by the government are not sufficient. Uh, for example, we can't fire the person who takes bribes. Uh, we can't do it in accordance with the code of the Russian Federation because uh, mm, uh, this uh, uh, means uh, court hearings and uh, just waiting for some conviction and all that and all that. So uh, it's impossible to do it on the local corporate level and regulate uh, conflict of interests is becoming uh, an important challenge. Uh, another example from a slightly different uh, area. Mm, we uh, must always keep it in mind, mm, uh, very important for top manager factor. It's just managing the number. Uh, we must optimize the company structure. Uh, and uh, mm, they mentioned studentization and optimization. Once Ibur uh, kind of um, was almost drowned within all uh, the subtle issues of the uh, labor code and labor law. So we try to generalize the information uh, received and then our HR services. Well, you realize that uh, my company, likewise, other ones represented here, we have a very broad geography. Uh, and. Uh, uh, so we uh, then used HR service to disseminate the um, conclusions we made, thus uh, liberating ourselves for focusing on uh, profession-specific task ta tackling. This is another direction for development. I think that those uh, are telling examples, and they uh, prove that um, there are two ways for development, uh, expansion horizontal and uh, in-depth. And the sixth slide, after the implementation of a new approach towards the functionality, we uh, re downsized our personnel and we uh, reduced the costs uh, of our, for, on our function for the uh, company. We could concentrate on our profile tasks. We uh, could uh, handle new challenges, and we started responding to new legal risks. At the same time, I believe that even uh, given this optimization uh, in numbers and costs, and the number of personnel and costs, we still have further area for improvement. Uh, improvement in depth, but not uh, uh, expansion. So probably I'm uh, making a digression from the central topic, but I'd like to appeal. Uh, don't be uh, ashamed of your service uh, destination. Uh, you are to serve the business. That's why you exist. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, Denise. And uh, in this regard, I have one question. This optimization it was not optimization of the legal department. It was just that you cut off some of the functions that are not uh, 
profession specifically. Yes, indeed, we started following the uh, way, the approach of standardization. Yes, so uh, this is another possible approach. Uh, so we've heard all the presentations planned. Uh, now we can summarize uh, the results. Some speakers want to add something, I believe, but let's be very brief, a minute or two, not more. Uh, Dear colleagues, I think that we have already had a very important discussion and it was quite interesting. And the first conclusion that I can draw is that really, I agree with everyone uh, who made their statements here and with the definitions made, not always these definitions are correctly interpreted afterwards, but still, I agree with them. This is just the uh, conf uh, confirms our resolution that many things depend on uh, several factors. Approaches depend on several factors. That depends uh, on what sector the company is working on, on the structure of the company, whether it is represented across Russia or represented by one facility or several facilities or the staff potential of the market. That determines the specificity. We also mentioned the specificity of regulatory actions. Therefore, the palette is quite different. In each sector, in each company, the situation might be different and different approaches would be valid. And it is quite reasonable. And I value the experience of my colleagues that also seems quite interesting. However, there are such uh, things with which probably I would agree only partly. First and foremost, several times it uh, has been mentioned that the function of uh, GR and compliance are specific functions. Yes, they are specific, and I agree with that. What is their specificity? We have to think about it, particularly GR function. What is its specificity? What are the secret thoughts uh, which we do not formulate explicitly? The present day situation of total uh, combating corruption and transparent rules that are imposed show no specific features. We have to work following the rules and we work following the rules. It is highly important. Uh, my colleague Anne has already left. And I agree uh, that these are ambitions. I would like to apologize, but that is not so bad. I don't know when uh, the authorities of the country formulated the task of uh, annual 10% increase of the GDP. That was also quite ambitious, but there is no ba uh, nothing is bad about it. When uh, the community is at the crossroads, the ambitions play the decisive role. We, as lawyers, can protect uh, different viewpoints depending on what is beneficial to us. We can say, why should we assume the responsibility for something? Let it be. Then I have the question, have you never heard from your employees, why do we have such low salaries? Why our bonuses are lower than in the other departments? What should we do? And there is a question to the managers and to the legal structures. How in this situation to keep your personnel, how to compete with legal companies that might attract them? Uh, should we just ask for salary offering nothing to the company instead? Well, this is a possible trend, but everything depends on, on ambitions. If we raise a question about our uh, bonuses and uh, option programs, we also should remember uh, what for are we receiving them for our uh, achievements in the past and or probably we receive them for having a modernist company that is advancing and becoming a leader. This also should be taken into account when we are talking about ambitions. Moreover, I don't know uh, the situation in your companies, but with us, uh, keep and uh, bonuses and option programs are common for the managers. We take into account the corporate performance. We are responsible for the total success of the company. 
we don't uh, have our own KPI at the l to the level of the head of the department, so we are just sailing in the same boat. Of course, they are awaiting for us to make the decisions. Of course, uh, they, it was mentioned that we cannot take decisions, but I'm not speaking about uh, decision making, but I'm speaking about the development of the decisions. And probably, once again, I have to stress that speaking about uh, management of regulatory risks, we don't mean that we have to invite prime ministers. We are not doing it. This is done at the level of shareholders, and we have never invited such uh, managers. And for these functions, we have a special uh, service of the protocols. And this is a different story. This is not management of regulatory risks. I understand that we are just uh, at the start of our way, and we are just uh, starting our discussion. I hope not. So for some time, we're going to have that uh, misunderstanding. But this just shows that we have to constantly carry on this discussion, and eventually we are going to move for forward due to our ambitions. Then I'll sum up uh, one uh, statement. It seems to me that Mr. Reiner, I have a question to Mr. The head of compliance in Shell Company, to whom is he accountable? Uh, no, the head of compliance in Shell reports into the legal director. That was important. But it's two separate legal lines. Director. No, it's the legal director is also the, the ultimate responsible for, not for compliance, that's a business responsibility for the provision of services, advice, support for compliance. But there are two separate streams, or two separate lines, and to make it worth, we also have compliance officers who are non-lawyers. Yeah, but, uh, no, but what was important, all of us, uh, can refer to Mr. Narayner. There are three international companies represented, Coca-Cola, Alcatel that I represent, and Shell Company. And all of us, including myself, uh, have compliance. That is a team of people specializing in certain uh, activities, but it is headed by the general counsel or the general lawyer. I won't uh, make, draw any conclusions. It just should be understandable from our discussion. Dear colleagues, as I expected, we didn't keep within the time that was allocated for us, but it is pleasant that for the second year we are discussing the same things, though it is not uh, really the case. And I think in one year's time uh, that uh, will be even more interesting because we'll acquire a new experience, it is quite obvious that the discussion and the problem is due to the fact that GR compliance and legal support are the trends of activity where uh, 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 legal knowledge is necessary. Thus, there is a transition of lawyers to GR that has already happened in Megaphone and in Rosneft Law. The uh, former main lawyer is uh, currently at the head of GR. And that is due to the fact that legal knowledge is necessary. Unfortunately, today we didn't discuss. That was just an attempt made by Ruslan uh, to uh, discuss the functionality. But being lawyers, for us, it is difficult uh, to uh, discuss the functionality of compliance. And we didn't discuss it in the GR functionality. And here we have the bottleneck, because we have to divide that field in that particular place. So probably next year we have to invite our vis-a-vis, -vis, our colleagues, our opponents 
on that question and will share their experience in respect of uh, distribution of functionality and the boundary gray zones, which uh, will be determined to a certain extent in different companies. In any case, I'm very grateful to you for patience, for showing interest to our panel discussion. I wish you to have a pleasant uh, afternoon and see you in one year time. Thank you. Дорогие коллеги, также благодарю всех за участие. Спикер. I would like to thank everyone for participation, speakers and other participants. If you have uh, the questionnaires, please fill in the questionnaires stating what you like, what you didn't like, and proposals on continuation of the discussion will continue it uh, within that year. Thank you.